So welcome everybody. It's super. We are really, really excited on behalf of uh, the organizer of this workshop uh, to have you all. The um, attendance is full, uh, and I apologize. Uh, you could you can transmit my apologies to those who couldn't come. That you know, uh, we were overwhelmed by the success of this uh, proposal for this workshop. And it shows, I think, the interest of the community and the, the need to like get together and discuss on these big issues that are how can we develop meaningful and uh, trusted uh, benchmark for the method we are developing to analyze transposable elements. And so today we are going to talk about benchmark, but principally how can we as a community develop a benchmark that we all um, agree on and that we all feel comfortable with. And because, because we are we going are to be, to be limited, limited with time, uh, only four time. hours today, we have decided to um, um, have a focus mainly on the topic of annotation. We'll discuss more um, uh, in a minute about what we exactly mean today about T annotation. But you can take this, take this as an excuse for being all together and thinking quite hard about uh, developing benchmark. So just a few words about, I think it's important that we all get together into what we will discuss today, but what also we won't. And what we won't discuss doesn't mean we will never talk about it. It means that we will need to find just another workshop <laughs> to, to do that. So today, the goal is to really uh, go through the general thought process behind constructing a benchmark, which includes uh, present some method and metrics that are needed. So we have four fantastic guests, uh, speaker that are going to talk about their experience, their knowledge, and also some method that they have been developing that could be applied to benchmarking. Uh, we will also present a few short examples, but really examples. Um, and uh, we hope to have a deeper discussion uh, on this single use case that is T annotation. So once again, it's a pretext to think hard about benchmark. Annotation is a Probably the broad, actually from the preliminary results of the survey we sent the other day, this is the topic that most people are interested in, uh, first and foremost, I would say. Um, and also discuss the future of a community in form. So you, you are representative of the community, uh, and uh, this is really the goal to develop this community in form benchmark. What we will not do today is give tutorial, really, you, you can relax, you won't have to open a terminal. Uh, <laughs> uh, we won't uh, neither show demo of uh, software like we did in Uppsala. Uh, we won't also advise you uh, on choice or approaches to generate uh, ground truth data or gold standard data. Uh, but we hope we're going to think about it and we, that you're going to help us think about it. And we won't also, and this is very important to keep in mind, we won't advise you on to which tool is best to do what. Right? It's, just a quick uh, look at the, um, this this schedule. Sorry, uh, so I'm doing right now the uh, not the introduction, which I am one minute late. Sorry, Jess, but uh, Jessica will just take it over with uh, a presentation of the T Hub right away, and then we will uh, discuss about the framework that we propose to really construct this um, um, this community informed benchmark. So, what are the tools and the mean? Uh, when I mean tools, I don't mean bioinformatic tools. I mean um, organize, organizational tools uh, that, um, well, actually both. <laughs> you will see. Sorry, too early. Um, but how we think we can develop, what are the, the, the means that we're going to put together to develop this benchmark? And then we will have, uh, our, no, you see the talk are before the coffee break. <laughs> it's all right. So we will have uh, four amazing speakers. Hadi Kenneville from uh, URGI Versailles, who is the, the, the brain behind the fantastic rapid package. And we will have Ariane Smith uh, from the ISB Seattle, who's the other brain behind Repeat Masker, Repeat Modeler. Uh, Ting Xuan Chen, who is here and, uh, from New Zealand. It's fantastic. Thank you very much for coming. Who will present a simulator. And uh, Robert Hubley, who is also a um, developer of uh, Repeat Masker, Repeat Modeler, who will tell you a lot about uh, another simulator called Garlic. We have a coffee break, we will need it. And uh, then we will present you an example, a way, uh, just uh, once again, an, an excuse to uh, put our brain to the, to the thinking about developing benchmark that uh, we have been working on, uh, Jess, Yuan, and I, on a prototype for a benchmark for TI annotation. So it's once again, an excuse to raise question, concern, get uh, suggestions. Very hard word for me this morning. And then, Probably the most exciting part, we will have probably an hour or so 
of Q&A. You will see this Q&A will be guided into a different theme in order to stay on track and stay on time. But thank you very much. And uh, without further ado, Jessica is going to talk to you about the Tea Hub. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Clement. So I'm proud to say that I did make this logo. So not only do I contribute other things, I made the look. <laughs> I made the logo as well. That's great. So what is Tea Hub? What, what are we trying to do here? So it is, you may have started out in the Tea Hub, in the Tea Hub, in the transposable element field, didn't know where to start. There's so many protocols. Where, where do you even, what papers do you read? What protocols are there available? Um, it would be nice to have. And so what we thought was kind of having this nice organization. So um, trying to put all these resources kind of into one spot. And so not be almost like a portal for different resources. And so here is the QR code for T, I believe, tehub.org, so the website. And the idea is to provide to a place where we can put tutorials and workshops. Um, also a nice uh, repository for resources and also talking about um, centralized vocabulary because I know sometimes uh, defining all those things, uh, all the different terms that occur in our field can be quite challenging to try to put that together for yourself. So having that nice ontology is nice to, it would, would be great to have in one spot, all nice to find. And then also providing a bioinformatic framework for different programs. If you don't know how to get involved, um, there are many, many ways you can get involved. So we have a Slack channel for on trend, the Transposons Worldwide, you have the uh, channel uh, hashtag TE-Hub. And not only are you welcome to come, they are very public meetings. They're not like registration or somehow you have to pass some sort of test. I don't know. Um, you're welcome to come and you're also welcome to propose topics. So it's very, we really want this to be, you know, we might have started it and my, I, um, but we want, really want this to be community driven. So if there's a topic you feel strongly about, please propose it and then maybe lead the discussion and the talk for that particular meeting. Uh, there also is a artic an article on TE Hub um, in mobile DNA. There's another QR code for that, but you should just be able to search an NCBI and those kinds of things. Um, there's also, oh, what was it formerly known as Twitter? Okay, sorry, so unfortunate. So X, no, okay, whatever. Twitter, X, Twitter. Thank you. I'm sorry, I never know like what to call about that. Say that. Okay. Okay, you don't have to use it. Yeah, that's true. Uh, then we also have a TE Hub YouTube channel, and um, I know that someone came up yes to me yesterday and said, "Hey, thanks for tutorial tutorial on YouTube for." telling me how to uh, calculate divergence from repeat masker output. So uh, that's nice to know people are using it and so that it is available. And there's some great tutorials um, I myself to figure out how to use your pet. I followed, I followed Yon's because I hadn't ever done it myself until a couple years ago. So it was nice to have that, ni nice to have that guide. Um, there is also, if you go on the Tee Hub website, there's a link to those. Okay. So thub.org for the website, the platform is a wiki platform. So all you have to do to be able to, to register and contribute to the page is have an org, org ID. And that's just kind of a little bit of a layer to make sure that you're not, you know, just anyone randomly trying to edit the web page. So, so far, I believe as of us making this PowerPoint for this, we have 631 bioinformatic tools listed, 180 databases, 38 published protocols, and we have an index of, of video tutorials. We also have documentation about upcoming conferences, classification schemes, I believe there are at least four or five of them, and trying to, to, to put those out there, and then outreach and teaching resources as well. Highly recommend, there's a lot on this website, I recommend just kind of messing around, trying to uh, navigating different pages, uh, seeing what's there. So, and again, it is relatively easy editing. Um, it took me only about, sometimes it can take me a little while to figure out some of these editing things, but with the tutelage of Clement, it only took me about three minutes. So it's really nice. So able to, to edit these pretty quickly and pretty easily. 
All right. So for a few milestones, uh, okay, here's the QR code for the white paper, but again, you should just be able to find it on NCBI. So in 2020, we had the creation of T-Hub, a T-Hub website, and the publication of the paper a year later. And the first workshop, which was, again, great to work with uh, Clement and Yohan again, um, presenting these ideas and doing the demo on, uh, I believe, the last day of the Uppsala conference. And there were six software, two database demos. And it was really nice to have the virtual machines as well, so people could actually use uh, these programs as they were being demonstrated. Um, and we have also submitted a, a grant, an SF grant for TE Hub. And now you are, be, you are part of the last two bullet points uh, for the second TE workshop during ICTE 24. We're right here and developing benchmark methods is what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, this is a lot of text, but this, these are the main objectives uh, for the NSF grant. And I'm gonna just really briefly, you can read what's going on in each one, but the three main points are developing tutorials and workshops. So part of that is getting, uh, doing pre, pre uh, workshop surveys. You, I believe you were sent one. You'll see some of the information later, or we'll talk about it later. I will. Um, and uh, so engaging the community that way, developing, getting real feedback from the community to tailor it for the community. Um, so that's one objective. Objective two is computational infrastructure, workflows, and benchmarks. And that's, again, community-driven. All of this is community-driven. But the idea is to have a collection of workflows that are easy to use, centralized place, um, and, are, and um, are, will be containerized or uh, organized with work, workflow scripting technology. Um, and then being able to coordinate benchmarking data sets and methods a bit easier. Again, this is just to make, the, these are all to make um, things easier for the entire community. <laughs> So developing that. Um, and the last objective I spoke a little bit to earlier is having a, not only a centralized repository, but also a structured vocabulary um, and a protocol so we can standardize some of the data storage, contributing, searching, sharing. Okay. And these are the organizers. Um, I'm pretty sure the most recognizable one of us is Clement. Um, <laughs> Um, so if you want to learn more about TE Hub, uh, here are the organizers, the four of us here that we've already talked about, that you've probably seen uh, quite a bit of us. And you can also talk to Hadi Josefa and Alex. Okay, so now I'm going to hand it off to one of my fellow members. Okay, <laughs> I was like, I think it's you. All right, so um, this is a, a bench mark in fact it's a mark to to for benching and uh, i like the the picture to illustrate uh, what we what we're gonna do so uh, uh why do we need to talk about a benchmark uh, you may have seen that uh, in some paper uh the 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 benchmark are poorly described so that brings some uh, reproducibility problem and uh, sometimes uh, the scripts are also not available. So in an uh, open science way, it's kind of uh, problematic. Uh, the metric used are not always well known by the community. So it's not easy to understand what is done. And so uh, fortunately today, there are the uh, guest speaker that will talk about that. Uh, the choice of the reference, the golden standard, is not uh, really easy. Uh, if you uh, want to use um, a, a true uh, golden standard, I mean a, a real one from a, a, an assembled genome, it's better to get a, 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 a good annotation, I mean, uh, done by the community, using a lot of tools to avoid some bias when you will uh, compare your... Uh, uh, true annotation done by the, the tool and uh, your annotation from your tool. Uh, it's really important to link the benchmark to the biological question. And uh, um, another problem with the benchmark is that they are often uh, um, developed uh, by uh, the authors uh, of a, a tool. And um, it may bring some bias because uh, when you do a tool, you want to show that it's the better. So there is a need for something more uh, universal. 
And uh, if you already have uh, tried to develop a benchmark, you may know that it's uh, time consuming and unfortunately not well uh, valued in terms of publication. So for, for all these reasons, there is a need for uh, a discussion within the community. And the TEAB is, uh, according to me, the, the, the good way to do that and uh, to establish method that uh, achieve uh, some uh, consensus. Uh, we know that uh, there are so many ways to uh, benchmark. Uh, there are many things to benchmark, like uh, T-annotation, T-identification, T-classification, or, or, or structural variant. But uh, unfortunately, as we just have a four hour for the workshop and we have to focus uh, on a specific uh, area, we decide to choose uh, the T annotation. And I am pretty sure that that will be enough and maybe we will haven't got enough time to discuss all what we want to discuss. Uh, what, uh, how do we uh, build a, a framework to launch all what you need for, for, for benching your tools. In fact, there are three different uh, uh, major steps. The first one is uh, to generate your ground truth uh, data or the, your golden standard if needed, or you have to use a, an uh, uh, official uh, golden standard that is already available. Then you have to uh, launch the tools that you want to evaluate. And uh, finally, you have to establish your metric to compare the different tools. So a, a good way to make it easier for the, for the users is to get a, a way, a framework that can uh, launch all the three steps in one. So here is a picture to explain a bit uh, in an easier way, uh, the, the, the framework. So as I just say, you have first a gold standard generation or usage from uh, uh, some golden standard uh, that are available, then the test and follow by the evaluation. <laughs> Travis will uh, show an example of uh, a way to do that. And uh, that's it. <laughs> Before I get started, how many people in this room have developed some software to do something with analysis? Okay, so a bunch of you. When you developed that software, did you test to see if it worked well? Yeah, good. Okay, this about the same number of hands. That's good. And that means you've developed a benchmark of some sort, right? And some of you have, have probably put a lot of effort into developing a benchmark. Maybe some of you not quite so much. How many thought it was really easy to come up with what the what the approaches should be to benchmark their software? Not quite big enough. Tap tap can they, if I swallow it. Okay. So so I I think it's safe to say it's not trivial to come up with a with a either the rules for how you should assess your software or the actual software that you have to to write in order to be able to to benchmark what you've built. Right. So there's build the tool and then build the, the software. So I'm going to talk a little bit right now about kind of the general issue of what to do when you are building a benchmark, not the tool that you want to assess, but the actual tool for assessing the tool you want to assess. So so this is this is the the, the sort of the core idea. And Johan has already kind of given a hint of this, right? If I want to build a benchmark, what do I do? Well, I need to have uh, some input data that my software is going to work with. And I need to, uh, I, I need my software, it will produce an output. And I want some notion of what correct output looks like. And I need then to be able to compare those to each other, right? In some way, measure whether the output produced by a particular competitor piece of software agrees with what I want it to produce. That's uh, effectively what a benchmark uh, 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 amounts to, and the, this collection of metrics is something that's complicated to, to come up with. Uh, and I'm going to kind of describe a, a generic notion of, of how to think about that and tie that into what we're trying to do in TE Hub to make it a little bit easier to build benchmarks going forward. So uh, in the context of what we're talking about today, a, an input might be a genome. Right. So if we're going to be talking about how to annotate a genome, well, the input that the software needs to work on would be a genome, for example. And uh, we need to have some notion of truth, a, a, a gold standard or ground truth uh, uh, annotation. 
that we hope that our that any particular software that we run will recover accurately. Right. So then we have some notion of a of a tool or a competitor, which might be a, a, a particular piece of software, but not just the software, but particular parameterization of that software, because you could run software with one set of parameters or another set of parameters. Each of those is a different competitor in some way in a in a pantheon of competitors for which is the best way to to, for example, annotate your software. And that that competitor, right? Each competitor will produce some kind of an output. And our goal is to uh, compare. Oh, oh, sorry. This is an important notion for me is that from a perspective of a of a benchmark, the competitor should be what I think of as a black box, right? So there's some input, which is the genome, for example, for annotation. And then there is some system that performs magic, right? Whatever method it uses, whether it is using sequence alignment uh, as the basis of providing annotation, maybe it uses some AI method and it doesn't even have a data set of sequences that it compares to and it magically assigns names. Maybe it picks positions out of a hat and it just happens to do them accurately. It doesn't matter from a benchmark's perspective, the details of how the tool that we're competing works should not matter to the benchmark. And so we think of this as a, as a black box that has some rule that says what kind of input must that system accept and then on the other end, what kind of output must that system produce without any consideration for the for the details of how it will produce that output? Really important idea behind the way I think of a benchmark as working. Uh, and then our job is to to the job of a benchmark is to have provided the particular input and then to assess the output that's produced by a competitor by comparing it in some way to the truth that we've provided. Right. So that comparison works by by building some kind of a system for producing an evaluation and that system for producing evaluation takes the truth and the output produced by a particular competitor and somehow compares them based on some collection of of uh, of comparisons producing some collection of metrics which is a non-trivial enterprise to come up with what that set of metrics is but it's part of the process of building a benchmark Okay, so this this picture in some ways draw de describes to me what I think of as a as a as a an appropriate or, or effective benchmark uh, framework. Uh, oh, and I guess the uh, important thing is your your tool better produce some kind of a report at the end, uh, a collection of summary statistics uh, that describe how well, right, the the meanings of these particular or the outputs of these particular measures. Okay, so. Expanding on that a bit, if I build a benchmark, I need to provide some input. I need to I need to create some input, <clears throat> whether that's based on a community contributed uh, annotation of a particular genome that's beautifully annotated, whether that's a simulated uh, input, whatever the particular input is, it's input that will be given to a competitor, then that competitor must work on. Uh, I have to produce uh, some notion of the of the so both the truth and the input, and then a, a define what the collection of measures are, and not just define it, but actually write the software that will that will produce those metrics, right? So that it will ingest the results of competitors, compare it to known truth, and produce the particular reported measures along the way. That's a, the job of a of a benchmark developer, and in, and super importantly. Given that we've talked about the competitors as being black boxes, right, in some way, that each of the tools that might run will work however they work, the only thing that we really need to do when we're building a benchmark is to define what input format a competitor, a black box must receive. This is essentially what port, right? This is it's often called in software an API, but it's a it's a a, a data, it's a, a a specification of the data format that the tool must accept. And then a specification of the format that a data uh, that a that a competitor must produce, right? Which I've drawn in green here, and that's fundamentally what we're building when we're building a benchmark, right? What that hasn't talked about is the details of what the competitor has to do. It's just talked about what we as a benchmark creator uh, need to be able to uh, to provide. So zooming out a little bit. How does this work then? If you've benchmarked software, you all know that this is effectively what you do: is you 
uh, you for each competitor, which might be a whole bunch of different parameterizations of your tool. You've all done parameter sweeps if you've written software and then tried to assess what's a good way to run your software. So it could be a competitor of, of a variety of implementations of your tool. It could be a, com a comparison between your software and other software or just using other people's software. You might be assessing different, different competitors uh, in that way, but you take one, you plug it into this infrastructure. So you say the, the, the black box that will produce an output now is this particular competitor choice, right? This choice of tool press parameterization, and then it ingests the input, produces some output, which the, the benchmark developers tools have used to produce some kind of a report for that particular tool, right? Then you move on to the next competitor and you do it again, right? So that produces another output for the, for the next tool. And you do that as many times as you have competitors that you wish to compare. And that's effectively what the process of, of benchmarking analysis amounts to is first you have to have built the benchmark and then you have some notion of how you compare the tools and then you actually perform the comparison along the way. And then there's some post-processing that needs to be done in order to produce collective summary statistics across all of them. You'll produce a figure, a grid of results, uh, whatever the, the particular output is along the way. I clearly got excited with the drawing coloring scheme that I could I could produce there. Um, and this is likely to be some script that, again, is, is created by the, the benchmark creator in the same way as the scripts that were used to produce metrics in the first place, scripts to produce whatever kind of summary statistics or, or figures uh, uh, come out the other end. OK. So this is what, a, a, what I think a, a robust benchmark framework ought to provide. It should, it should meet all the conditions I just described a moment ago. It should be easy to install right, and set up and to run, which is not necessarily true of every piece of software that's ever been created. Uh, so that's an, but it's an important thing to remember when you're building a benchmark, right? This is, I'm not talking about the software, the black box being easy to install. I'm talking about the benchmark itself, right? The, how do you get the data that's used to, to evaluate a, a tool? How do you get the scripts that will be used to produce the metrics? Those are the things that need to be easy to install and run. Uh, it must be easy to add a new competitor into this framework. So add a new entry to a new a new black box into the kind of a pipeline, and it really ought to be open source. So not the software that you're evaluating, but the benchmark itself should be open source. Primarily, this means two things to me. One is it's visible, so anybody can look and see what you've written in terms of the the code. So they should be able to rerun your benchmarks and get the same results that you got. If uh, in our case, maybe if we come up with an annotation framework and somebody says, ah, it really should have this extra metric that you're computing, they should be able to dump a pull request into a GitHub repository to add an extra evaluation that should be done. Or if they recognize that we've made some calculation incorrectly to fix it. Or if they're not particularly inclined to write software to make those changes, they should be able to, to submit requests or issues or ask questions about a particular benchmark. So it's an open process. This is... I think the ideal for what a what a good open benchmark ought to look like, and this is where TE Hub uh, comes in, is that we aim to assist the community in building an infrastructure that will make it easier to build benchmarks. Okay, part of that will mean that we'll build a couple of benchmarks on our own with community input, and part of it will be that we will uh, we will engage with the community to to make it easier to build other benchmarks like that. And so it's going to look kind of like what we've drawn here. The idea is. The framework is the framework I've just described and how we'll implement it is uh, inside of a containerization system. I will assume that most folks in the room have heard of Docker. Uh, this is a, a framework that's designed to make it very easy to create a what amounts to a virtual machine uh, in which you you define the collection of software that's uh, that's available to run. It's in a system that can simply be run without having to set up a bunch of software to install and deal with the, the conflicts that are present. It's already set up inside of the framework that, that, that's that been created. So there will be a Docker container that uh, that we, TE Hub, produce or that we help new benchmark developers produce that will consist of the data, right? both the input data that a competitor would look at, but also the 
ground truth, the, the, the gold standard uh, data to which it will be compared. It will also consist of the collection of comparison scripts right, that are used to produce these kind of evaluation metrics uh, that, that make for the benchmark results. Uh, and that's so that's one uh, Docker container. And then there's a second Docker container, right, that needs to be created for each competitor tool. This is a fairly straightforward way to be able to to uh, integrate right individual tools into this larger framework. And uh, and this Docker container is in pink that may not be visible to uh, to the back of the room. It says container created by tool developer. Right, so there's got to be a container, and it's got to be created by a tool developer or by someone who's interested in evaluating a tool. If the tool developer didn't get around to making such a container, right? But importantly, we're not. Just, I don't think it makes sense to just leave that to the developer of the tool without any guidance. So the key idea is to provide a template, right, where that template gives uh, uh, insight into what the uh, the input format must be, and some pre an example pre-processing script to take whatever the format that our right input data is in, for example, a FASTA file. And if your tool doesn't take FASTA files, well, you are going to need to take a FASTA file and pre-process that in some way in order to prepare it for your particular tool. Right? There may be naming conventions that are different between them, and and so some some kind of pre-processing needs to happen. That pre-processing lives inside the black box. Right, the black box accepts a FASTA file, for example, and then has to change things the way it wants to without the benchmark caring how that's done. Okay, so we provide a, a template for how that's done. And then on the other end, there's a this template also has what does the output format need to be so that our scripts can run on it. So again, maybe your tool produces output in one format and, and we need a bed file. And, and, and so the conversion from one format to another format is the job of the black box. And we can provide a template that gives some sense of what that needs to look like, right? So any developer or evaluator who wishes to be able to plug into a framework that's been created by the benchmark developer only needs to have a very simple implementation of a Docker container that runs their tool meeting our particular input and output format requirements. Uh, and, oh, I have something that's happened here, but I'm not sure what, okay. And so then how does, uh, how does this whole framework that we've created work when it comes to actually producing a lot of, uh, of, or to evaluating a lot of tools? Some of these tools take quite a long time to run, depending on how complicated the, the input is and how complicated the analysis is. And there may be a lot of, of, of systems or competitors that are being analyzed. So how do we deal with that computationally? And one kind of a simple way to control that is to use a, a, a workflow system called Nextflow, uh, which you have to install on your system. And then once it's installed, it will manage the job if the benchmark developer has designed it correctly, which we will, right? It will manage the job of saying, okay, great. Now you run this Nextflow script. And because we've defined all of these pieces, as long as the competitor tool has built a, a Docker container that meets our specifications, it can send that uh, analysis either to your own computer, if the kind of computational scale that you need isn't particularly large, it can drop it out to a, an HPC system, a compute cluster, uh, I'm using Slurm here as an example. Uh, what I haven't drawn here is that it can drop it out to a, a framework uh, that we're putting in place right now for making use of, uh, of National Science Foundation in the US uh, computational infrastructure that's essentially an academic cloud or out to, to Amazon Web Service, or we can expand out beyond that because Nextflow supports a variety of options for this so that if you've got large scale compute projects that they can be distributed to whatever compute environment you have available so that you don't need to wait years to get the results. The results can be, can be managed in a fairly straightforward way because Nextflow simplifies this. So what does this mean as a developer of a tool? You create the Docker container that meets the black box specifications and the entire benchmark manages everything else for you. So you don't have to figure out how you do an analysis within this larger framework. And alternatively, if you're just a user who wants to be able to compare these tools that have been analyzed or that have been created, right? You can pick up a new tool, you can run an analysis or a few of these, run the analyses to see for yourself what the outcomes are going to be. 
Okay, that's the the general design that we're imagining going forward with this. We'll talk about a specific example of a benchmark, but this is the the big framework that we're moving in the direction of creating to simplify the task of both benchmark creation for those of us who wish to create benchmarks, but also benchmark uh, utilization, right, for tool developers along the way. So it's easier to be able to compare one tool to another. And uh, just another slide. So uh, so this is what TE Hub is going to be doing, right? We're going to build this infrastructure that I've talked about, the do example Docker containers, Nextflow containers, uh, and acquiring these National Science Foundation compute resources, which is underway right now. We'll work with the community uh, to both uh, uh, build, initially build, understand the specifications, and this is part of what this meeting is for, for the kind of benchmarks that we might want to create, and then to improve those over time, and also to help others to build benchmarks that fall into this kind of framework. Uh, and then lastly, to um, provide a repository, both for the collection of benchmarks that we create, Right, we as a community create, uh, and also for the Docker containers for individual tools that can be plugged into those uh, containers so that they don't get lost to antiquity. We always have the ability to go back and see which containers implemented which particular versions of which particular software so that there's a, a history of how these comparisons can be performed over time. And all of this will live inside of the, the, the TE Hub infrastructure, pending grant funding, which... The grant has still not been reviewed. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it off to Clement. Thank you, Travis. So once again, uh, if uh, you have uh, questions, uh, please take note of them. We will have uh, hopefully plenty of time at the end of the session today to um, hear about your question, your suggestion, and comments. And just a few words uh, before moving on to our guest speaker. Uh, one thing is, uh, you know, you might even have experienced that you go to a very amazing meeting. Uh, you have uh, thrown out a lot of great ideas, uh, groundbreaking ideas even, uh, a lot of promises. And unfortunately, um, we all know that it's very hard to, well, make it happen, actually. Uh, and so one idea that we have and that we would like to propose is following this workshop. Um, gathering all these ideas, making a synthesis of all of this and submitting these ideas and this synthesis to the community uh, uh, through maybe the help of a white paper, a guideline that would be the synthesis of our work today. Um, a suggested outline for this white paper would be first talking about the general concept and issues about making benchmark. I'll detail a little bit after. Uh, and then focus on a case study design, which is both an example and a way to Put, put our ideas uh, to, to, to the matter, uh, in, the, in, in that case, a benchmark for T annotation, but also in this white paper talking about how do we uh, handle the community support is uh, probably one of the most important parts here. So uh, for this point in particular, we have created a blank document that if you scan here, you'll be directed to an, ep an empty page, but maybe not anymore. Uh, and all the ideas are great here. So if you're like, I would like to maybe suggest this idea. I would like maybe in the future to talk about that. Or I think when you suggest this, this is completely wrong. Well, please um, document it here. And if you have any trouble accessing the document, I will receive tons of emails saying that you can't and you will be allowed eventually. Um, all right. Okay. So first, the general concept in issues. I, I'm not going to go into a lot of details because we actually haven't concluded this uh, workshop today. But... This first part might uh, be talking about what consideration we have about the data to be analyzed and the goal of the analysis uh, of a different type of benchmark. What metric should be measured according to the goal of the benchmark and uh, what, what, what metric can we use to make sure that we trust the, the benchmark and the benchmark achieve the goal. Uh, what computing framework should be used. So an example was uh, presented just uh, before me by Travis. And also how the feedback is handled regarding this benchmark, right? Uh, so this is very uh, uh, broad goals. Then the case study, as I was saying, is a pretext to get into the, the hardest matter. And for example, should include specific definition about the question we want to ask. So what is a true positive in the context of TN notation, true negative, etc and all the other metrics. Uh, there's also a need to highlight specific issues that what are, um, what, what is very complicated about TN notation, why uh, 
uh, still today, after maybe 20 years of uh, developing software, we still don't have a comprehensive benchmark. And many of you might be familiar with this paper that we call the Barbados paper, uh, that is actually extremely interesting and provide a lot of guidance, but unfortunately was not, and you know, it's it, no one is at fault here. Uh, it's just a matter of time and also resources. Uh, and we hope to solve this problem here with this the tier organization. So trying to go forward. And um, of course, we should expand it, thinking about now from the specific to a more generic case and lay out a plan, a timeline of how we're going to, as a community, put all those things together. Um, so this includes guidelines with the code supporting it, logistical support, so a little bit what Travis was uh, suggesting before. And finally, uh, the, the white paper following this workshop should also describe in length what, uh, how do we uh, handle the support from the community? So, describing how feedback and collection, um, feedback collection and contribution uh, process is handled. How do we do about volunteering and writing contribution through the T Hub channel? So, uh, Jess presented earlier a way to reach out to us in the T Hub. We have a very regular, oh, we have regular meetings and uh, anyone is uh, able to suggest, oh, we would like to meet maybe in three weeks, I have this idea, let's do that. Regarding the workshop, maybe we should meet now. And so this is the way we gather in the community. And of course, uh, we hope that the paper will be uh, crafted by volunteer within the T-Hub, but also endorsed by the community. So before going out in probably our favorite journal, Mobile DNA, uh, we we'll ask you your feedback and your suggestions. So it's the same link, but please use and abuse of this uh, and we'll deal with, with, with all that later. So um, just um, be rest assured, we, you all have communicated your emails. If you didn't send, send that to me and uh, you will receive uh, more details and how to, uh, to yes, uh, contribute, uh, of course. So you are not gonna be left alone. To, if you didn't take a picture of that, it's all right. Just to move on, and uh, because we are very, very excited uh, about hearing about our guest speakers, uh, we're going to first hear about uh, what, uh, everything that Hadi Kenneville has to tell us about his thoughts about benchmarking. Good morning. So we have this difficult task to start the expert uh, session to explain a bit uh, what we are doing for uh, benchmarking tools. So. What I'm going to present you is the, in fact, the way that uh, in our lab we benchmark uh, the tool. So it's uh, our experience, uh, what the choice we have done, and uh, what we what we do. So the 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 the, the, the goal of my talk is to present uh, not the benchmark but a benchmark. As you will see here, there is plenty of way to benchmark tools. So this is the, just the way that we benchmark the tools. So the rationale, the, the rationale of T annotation benchmark is just that you have your reference annotation here with transposable element. So you have your reference annotation here with the, the what we call the ground truth of the TEs, and you have your prediction here with your tools. Uh, and of course you have some prediction that match the reference annotation and other that doesn't. So the basic idea is just to uh, find the correct prediction, find the wrong prediction, and with that you can calculate what are the true positive here, the true negative here, the false positive, and the false negative here the one you missed. So having said that, you can calculate some metrics using uh, this uh, count of true positive, false negative, false positive, and true negative. So we represent this as this uh, matrix here with the prediction here, the prediction, you find something or you don't find something, and here is the, the reality. And the basic uh, metrics that are used for benchmark here is what we call here the sensitivity, called also the recall, which is the fraction of good prediction when the, the reality is true. Okay, that's the hard part of the talk, I think, probably. So this is the, the 
Well, when the things are true over all the, the reality when it is true. So it's a, what is called the sensitivity, it's ability to find the, the things uh, and, and to be able to detect all the good, uh, all the good, uh, all the reality. And you have also what we call the specificity. So the specificity here is the fraction of wrong prediction when the reality is false. It's something that is the opposite, in fact, of the sensitivity is the specificity. So here it's represented here. So it's a fraction here of true negative over the sum of the when the reality is false in fact. So the specificity is something that measure in fact the the ability to not to do good things. So having a, a high specificity means that your tool is able really uh, to good to give to give you a good result, but maybe can miss some of the of the of the true results. And there is another uh, error metric that is called the precision, and the precision is the fraction of good prediction over the false here. So I miss this thing. And this is uh, something that is related to the to the specificity, but that has other uh, other uh, properties that are probably better for the usage here. I, I will not go in the detail of uh, why we use uh, it's better to use precision uh, and not specificity, but somewhere you are um, measuring quite the same thing as a specificity. But there is a kind of trade off between uh, sensitivity or recall and the specificity of the, of the precision. That means that when you are when you want to have something that is really, you want to improve the sensitivity, very often it's at the detriment of the specificity. So there is a kind of trade-off that you have to, to measure. And in fact, when you benchmark your tool, you have always these two values that you have to consider. And there is a way to agglomerate uh, these two values in a, in, in a unique metric that is called the F1 score. That is, in, in fact, the mean harmonic mean between the precision and the, uh, the sensitivity here. So it's kind of mean between the two. So it's a convenient measure that, that integrates the both information of, the, of these two metrics. So that seems to be easy, easy now. But in fact, when you are dealing with transposable elements, there is a, 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 the main problem here is that for those that are false positive. Are there really false positive? Maybe they are all elements, elements that have not been detected uh, before because of some reason, maybe they are too generated or maybe the, 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 the way that the reference annotation has been provided is not uh, as missed this element, for example. And so we are, when we are dealing with uh, true genomes, in fact, we always have this uh, this problem that we don't know really what is really the truth. When you find something that is out of the reference annotation, maybe something that is true or not, and it's not so easy. So there is a way to deal with that. It's uh, what we did in, uh, in our lab, is, uh, to, uh, is to introduce in the genome randomly uh, seconds that we are no that are really true negative. So the simple way to do that is considering the coding sequence of the genes as true negative. And for that, we remove the, the UTR and, and the intron. So you, we just keep on the CDS, on the coding part of the gene, saying that if we have a match in this region, this is really a true negative. A false positive, in fact. It's not perfect, but it seems to be better than uh, to have uh, something uh, just uh, falling outside as as a as a false as a as a false positive. And the second way to do to deal with that also is to insert in your genome random sequence. So you may uh, think about random sequence as shuffled by denucleotides. Uh, a, a, a genomic sequence. Denucleotides are important because they preserve 
the the composition of of the of the of the DNA, and it's important for a transposable element because they have uh, in their dinucleotide a specific composition. The other uh, way to do that is to have the reverse sequence. So here, the reverse sequence is just taking a sequence but reading it without not complementing it, but in the other sense. So that make uh, uh, a random sequence with the, some good statistical properties about the composition of the of the sequence. So there is this two way to deal with this uh, false positive that we that, that we do. So that means that here, uh, when we compute the false positive here, we compute a false positive if they overlap this random or CDS sequence. And of course, everything that falls out of this uh, region, in fact, are, con are not considered in our benchmark. So uh, why we don't use a random genome? We, we may have used a random genome for, uh, for testing the, the benchmark, but for, for building our benchmark. But in fact, the, the thing is that it's really hard to have a good random genome that is really have the property of, of, a, of, a, of a genome. And uh, because we know that the annotation is affected by the T density of the region, the T size, the T divergence between the reference sequence and the copies that are present in the genome. The genome size also play a role because you, you have some somewhere some statistics. You have an E value very often in the tools that are used to detect and to align the, the, the sequence. The structure also is important. There is polyploidy repeats that may be something that may affect the, your annotation, give some false positive, and also the nucleotide composition. So because it is really difficult to do this type of uh, uh, random genome, in fact, we prefer to have this approach to take true genomes and to integrate in this genome some uh, region that are that we know that are not good uh, sequence. Okay, so uh, we build our benchmark on Arabidopsis thaliana because it's uh, not on, only because it's maybe our favorite genome, but also because it has interesting properties for T benchmark. Uh, this is a small genome, so it's easy to run. So it's important when you have to run uh, several tools and, 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 and it's important with different parameters and so on. And also it has a very old uh, TEs in the genome that are really difficult to detect, in fact, with general approach. So we, we work a lot on this uh, genome. So we now we know that this element exists. We know where they are. And so it's a, a, a genome where we, we our knowledge of T's is quite good, quite good. In fact, here in this graphic, it's an experiment we, we, we did, in fact, by building uh, with the closely, closely related uh, genome uh, of Arabidopsis thaliana, we built some consensus for every species here. And with this consensus, we, in fact, annotate the genome of Arabidopsis thaliana. And we found here that we detect many uh, new elements, many elements here. Uh, that are in fact very old. So we, we know that this is really composed by old elements. As I say, we, we, we know quite well this genome uh, with uh, different uh, tools analysis we, we did on, on this genome. We know that in th this is a dense genome with uh, half of the genome is, is our genes. We have a large, we have some transposable element. The part here are what we call the dark matter T. That means that it's all these T's that are that we can detect with new tech, new methods that have not been present, in fact, in in the reference annotation. The promoter and the dark matter. That dark matter is a part of the genome, in fact, that is not really known for for the moment. That we don't know what what they are. So this is a genome where, that we know quite well. So it's uh, I think it's uh, it's a good um, a good genome for for a benchmark. So our test genome is the following. So we shuffle uh, 8,000 uh, TEs coordinates from the, from the true coordinates of the T. We shuffle them in the genome. And uh, at each of these coordinates, we introduce the random sequence here, the reverse sequence. 
So that means that here is the real genome with these statistics. What we, I call extended coverage, in fact, is when you use this extra information from the uh, related species to annotate the genome. Here is the official certain annotation here that covers uh, about 20% uh, of the genome. So, of course, because we introduce these uh, new sequences that are random, in fact, and they can overlap some of the real annotation, we remove them, and that's uh, the, 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 the statistics of the new of the test genome when we remove the, the thing that overlaps. So we have here the, the T coverage, the extended coverage that, of course, remove. We have introduced here the R false positive, and we, of, of course, we remove also some of the exons because we have this random sequence. So I will present you a use case to illustrate a bit uh, how it deals with that. So just uh, this is not the topic of my um, of my talk, uh, just to, to illustrate things, but we, we develop these things to, to, to test a new tool that we are developing that we call Asher. Uh, just a few words uh, really rap rapid, rapidly is that, in fact, uh, uh, most of the tools we use, in fact, uh, are based on a tool that is called BLAST or BLAST-like uh, tools that are, in fact, not really developed for T annotation. Uh, and we think that maybe we can improve the annotation if we really do a tool that are dedicated uh, to that and try to uh, to do something. In particular, we can we don't really need to have the always the alignment of the sequence. We may skip sometimes uh, by just uh, looking for the coordinate and not having a, a good alignment or things like that. So. Uh, it's a it's a evolution of the duster uh, software that we that we developed already. So uh, the overview is not really to go in the detail of that, but because it's not the the, the thing. Just to say that in fact, he used what we call space seeds. That means that it's based on camer that camer that have some a place where you can have some mismatch. That means that when you have this camera, in fact, it can match every all this camera here. So it makes him uh, it very more sensitive than the classical approach as a blast. We hope so that. So this is the kind of thing we try to, to test. And uh, and we have something that is uh, uh, also work with iteration. That means that the, 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 the sequence you detect at the first uh, iteration can be reused on the second iteration to improve like that the, the annotation. That's really, and it also has a, a way to work uh, uh, on a self comparison of, of the genome. Okay. So, first result we, we have so we test uh, different tools uh, here. Uh, so, Minimap2, maybe you know Hasher is the one you we, we, we use here. Blaster is the tool that is inside, in fact, Repet, and you, that is used Blast, Repeat Masker, of course, and Blast N. Just here to see that if you compare uh, the specificity between the random sequence and the CDS, you see that you have a correlation between the two. So that means really that the CDS can be used as a as a as a way to measure for the false uh, for false positive. But as you see here, it really underestimates the false positive rate. So we think that it's better to use this random sequence uh, rather than uh, to use the, the, the CDS. Well, uh, the sp speed matters. Uh, in fact, the, the, when, you, when we have the, to test uh, tools, in fact, uh, there is something that is really important is the speed because uh, uh, this is very often a bottleneck for T annotation. Uh, in particular, when you, you have to deal with large genome. And generally, a uh, T annotation is not simply running one time the, 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 the tool, but several times. And it take, can take some resources. So we need to have something that I think uh, uh, take into account the, the, the speed. So here, uh, we have uh, this representation where you have here the, the duration the duration of the tools that mean that this is one of the metrics we, we need to, to have for benchmark is one that is important for us at least. And here you have the F1 score. Okay. So that means that if you are here, 
you are very good because you are quick and you give good results. Okay, so you 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 see. Uh, so in blue, it's uh, the 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 Asher, uh, just to to show you that we test different parameters and according to the parameters, you may have some results that are better than the other, of course. Uh, and uh, and uh, there is always a, a, a trade-off between the the speed and the performance. The the if you take times to do things, of course, you have better performance. That's that's uh, the the basic idea of all these tools. And you have always to deal with that trade-off and try to improve this trade-off. Uh, and here we we see that in fact, uh, even with uh, tools that have this quite the same performance, in fact. Uh, you um, you you may have some difference in, in in speed. In fact, quite important here. Uh, of course, repeat masker did a good job, but we are not surprised for that. But uh, you can see that blast n just blast n is not so bad, and I think we have to think about that. <laughs> Uh, it's just a matter of parameter, in fact, and uh, and, and uh, the and and the field and uh, the statistical issue of the evaluation of the e value that is behind that uh, that probably play a role here. But this is, has to be probably uh, more uh, more deeply uh, looked. Okay, so uh, the library size also matters. So there is some tools that are have better performance when the library size, the library is uh, the reference sequence that is large enough. So it's uh, it's important to have uh, that in mind. And you, you may have some tools that perform better with large large library than, than small library. And you see here that you have uh, uh, something that is, uh, you have similar performance, but you, you may have uh, here uh, four time faster tools uh, with the library, uh, according to, to, to the library. Here, we the, the experience is just to take the copy of a different accession of Arabidopsis and to map this copy on the genome. This is a use case that we could have in, in, in real annotation, not just relying on the reference uh, sequence, but using all the copies that are known uh, for the annotation. Uh, okay, speed matters, and this is really important for large genome. Annotation bias. So there, there is, uh, you want to say something about that? Of course, if you benchmark your tools and compare with tools that have been used for uh, the reference annotation, of course, you will have a bias. And here you can see this uh, quite well, this bias, uh, because here what we what we take into account as a ground truth, in fact, is this extended annotation. When we use extra seconds for the annotation compared to what has been used for the for the reference annotation from tier 10. So in this case, you see that uh, in fact, uh, we could have better performance and uh, and there is plenty of, uh, of uh, of TEs that has not been detected at first by the reference annotation because they use uh, tools or tools with some parameters that are not adapted to detect this other uh, element and uh, and this has uh, an importance. So e here, if we compare the tools with this extended annotation, in fact, we have results that are a bit different. So of course, Asher perform well because we developed it for this kind of uh, things. So it's, it's obvious. Uh, the important thing here is that really to use uh, the reference annotation that has been done with uh, different tools, with uh, a community behind that has improved the things manually, ideally, that have worked a lot on the reference annotation to, to be really uh, uh, to have the, 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 first, uh, uh, the first annotation uh, with, with, uh, with the tool that had been used, uh, uh, corrected and, 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 and improved. So it's, it's really important. So I'll just stop here with this uh, take home message. Uh, there is no absolute result. So there is not uh, absolute truth in benchmarking tools. There is uh, no tools that are better than the other. Okay. We are just able to compare the performance uh, 
between the tools. So that, okay, so we compare the performance between the tools and we can say that these tools can perform better in this condition. Uh, you compare on specific criteria and this is a part of the benchmark. So you are interested in a particular criteria and you build your your benchmark according to this criteria and maybe your criteria is not the same that the criteria for another for another team uh, because it, the criteria is really related to the scientific question you ask uh, and, and you want to deal with. So if you are working with large genome, in fact, the uh, speed is, will be probably more important than sensitivity. Uh, and if you are on a small genome that is already well known and you want to improve the notation here, the sensitivity is probably more important. So this is things that you have to take into account when you benchmark and you ask, you ask to choose your tool. Uh, if you want just to mask the sequence for the gene annotation, maybe you don't, some tools will be better than the other because they are quicker, because they are maybe easy to install and things like that. But if you want to go uh, to study really uh, TEs or uh, things like that, you may need to have other tools that are more adapted for this uh, specific task. With that, I finish just to thank my the URGI people, the my dream team here, <laughs> and uh, Johan, uh, of course, that is the backbone today of this uh, of this team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adi. The next speaker is Arian Smith. <laughs> 300 slides. <laughs> so I, yeah, yeah. So um, Travis asked me to not so much discuss, uh, you know, what I think um, uh, our, uh, the benchmarks that we have developed or my experience of how different programs work well. But what uh, my experience is with uh, the, the problems that you actually encounter when you look at the sequences in with my you know, long time experience, uh, then determine that something is wrong or is this right, right? So uh, I just have a whole bunch of examples. And so I would completely focus on TE annotation then here, which is fine because that is the focus. <laughs> and so the ideal TE annotation would be to so show for every bloody base that is TE derived at the end of an alignment to the original sequence that transposed in this, uh, because then you also know what happened to the base afterwards. Uh, of course, that is completely impossible. You, uh, uh, for one thing, you require an impossibly complete library. You never have a complete library, and it also has to be completely ac accurate. But that 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 is the one thing. Uh, uh, even given that. You know, the accept that you can't find everything. There are many problems that can be overcome and that a, a true challenging benchmark should address. And in my experience, every benchmark that we use is way too easy. It's, as Adi already mentioned, right, the result is if you use coding regions alone, they completely underestimate false positive. Uh, you underestimate, you think that something is a true positive, but it's actually completely a wrong alignment, those sort of problems. So, the, oh, okay, there is this list here. So the, the, the false positives have been introduced, of course, a something that not that many people probably are aware of overextension of real uh, matches is a, is a very big deal. Actually, in repeat mask, there are more bases that are falsely masked <laughs> the, because of overextensions of alignments than just purely, you know, there is nothing here. Uh, there are, uh, there's the problem of true matches to what non-repetitive DNA and things that we wouldn't like to mask, that we wouldn't want to annotate as a repeat, but they are homologous matches. Then there's the issue of false negatives, of course, uh, which is basically the same as incomplete matches. You don't get the whole thing. And then a, a much more complex and, uh, uh, you know, a multi-aspected uh, uh, problem is that you can uh, annotate something in the wrong way. So the false, dis um, false discovery, that, that means false negatives. There's no, this is, uh, no, no, these are false, yeah, they're true, but <laughs> false, 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 false positives. I just I started, I thought it started at the other side. Uh, all right. So obviously, if your program has poor alignment, pro, uh, pro, poor um, parameter settings, then you oh, cut off. 
cap penalties. Uh, you say that the background of your genome is something completely different. You get a lot of wrong things, right? So that's not really the things that I want to discuss. Uh, just what happens in nature. And the main sources of false positives that I see are the low complexity regions and tandem repeats. That's really the, the vast majority of the, and particularly simple repeats, they are a source of false positives. Even and I'm oftentimes showing uh, problems that are actually output of a repeat masker. So these are blunders by repeat masker. This first one isn't though. This is one that, uh, this was on Robert's poster. This is a, a, a three prime end of a line uh, that has a, a seed here. The, the small region that doesn't even look like a real um, uh, a simple repeat, if you stare at it, is a cause of uh, many, there's dozens of false uh, matches to the uh, our garlic uh, uh, benchmark. And this is a real repeat masker output. There is this nasty element uh, you know, recently added that has a real simple repeat in it. Uh, we use the repeat masker output uh, for this uh, element to build a seed alignment. We are already filtering actually quite a bit away, but this is the seed alignment and it's in DFAM. And that little, no, a little, is a massive blip there. There's all just alignments to simple repeats. So this is even with, you know, repeat master is doing a lot to avoid these things. Avoid these things. If you've ever looked at, you know, real alignments and false alignments, you know these things already. You see there are many features of false alignments uh, that, you know, you, I, I use uh, and, and others use to discover these things. So um, the transversions and transitions you expect in a homologous alignment to be approximately equal. At random alignments, you have twice as many transversions and transitions because, you know, uh, there are tw twice as many possibilities. So there's an indication. You see a high number of weird short indels. Um, there is a very biased competition of the matched bases. You can recognize quickly. And um, th there you can see very diverse but high scoring matches uh, against something that you then recognize as a, as a tandemly repeated unit. I've got an example of that. Yeah, this is actually also a real output uh, not if you run a piece match with uh, blast or with cross match, you don't get this. But this one was came out with N hammer. This is the uh, variable nuclear uh, VNTR region of SVA it has been brought up in the meeting already, and this was one uh, a match in the human genome. Uh, the first thing is SVA is very young. This is a highly diverse match. You know, you would immediately uh, already be suspicious for that reason. All the green uh, base, uh, bases here are Gs or Cs. If you look a little bit closer, almost all the matched bases are Gs or Cs. So uh, uh, complexity adjustment usually takes care of it. It's still not close enough. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, uh, oh, man. And uh, then if you call all the bases here, and I hope you all see that, if you, you can go down this uh, parallel here, this is actually an alignment of two completely unrelated uh, tandem repeats that ha happen to have the same length. It doesn't even have to be the exact same length, right? Something of the same length. You constantly see the matches that are there. If it's long enough, then it becomes statistically significant. <laughs> the matches keep coming back. So that is something that's probably very underappreciated as a source of uh, um, false matches. So I wanted to bring that up because I'm also going to include in the slides then what a benchmark should contain to give these uh, programs a real challenge. So, uh, first off, you need to give, you know, for the human genome, we have isochords. Many genomes have different levels. That is, the nucleotide composition of the genome is not even. You really need to uh, 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 make divergent backgrounds. And the natural levels of uh, low complexity reaches is much higher than you uh, uh, expect by chance. So low complexity reaches and simple repeats need to be naturally represented. And then you need to make tandem in your completely uh, uh, made up genome. You need to have your tandem repeats and satellites in there to give it a good challenge. So there's the overextensions of true alignment, still false positives there. Uh, the problem in, you know, I'm a very speciesist. I 
I'm, I happen to be human, most of you are, so I, I am into the amniotes, most of, and most of the TE copies that we look at are heavily fragmented, so they always have an end that is not complete, and the model continues. So your alignment program or whatever method you use, you know, wants to go as far as the score gets higher, I'm going to go on. And this happens a lot, and some of the overextension is unavoidable. Uh, you, you know, you have deletions through a micro homology or your basis next to that broken end of the element happen to be the same. You can't avoid all of it. And it especially gets bad if you have an element that is already of a particular low complexity and uh, has a preference to insert into regions that have the similar complexity. And I think now line one is the obvious one. Line one is 40% A. It's very a rich and it likes to insert in a rich uh, targets so the flanking dna of line one fragments tends to be very you know and it just goes on for a while because hey i see all these a's that match so that uh, that that is something that also again needs to be represented in the in the um in the benchmark if you make it uh so you can recognize them but pretty easy by i uh, it, it should also be automatable. We, we're doing something about it. So you have a nice low divergent alignment, and suddenly towards the end, it becomes much more diverged. This is a typical, uh, a typical uh, observation. And in the repeat masker output or other other outputs, you see that you know completely different elements are annotating the same region. One of them has to be an overextension. So benchmarks need to model this uh, natural fragmentation of the repeats, if you make the repeats yourself, of course. Uh, if you do large deletions, preferentially do it via some micro homology. And the uh, the target size of repeats, uh, the, the, the target size preferences, so, uh, um, jumping into uh, biased sequences also should be uh, represented in your benchmark. All right, and then there are homologous matches. They are true matches. You know, you, nothing went wrong, but <laughs> you don't want them. So the, the obvious one is there are, of course, uh, transposable elements that have been accepted. Um, and I'm fine with that. Uh, uh, there are also TE encoded proteins that are related to cellular genes, uh, elements like uh, uh, Maverick actually pick up really completely unrelated uh, genes sitting in your model, and you're going to match them in the real. Uh, you're going to start masking or annotating just normal cellular genes as uh, interspersed repeats, which is wrong, but the matches are right. Um, and if you do your uh, if you build a library in an, an, an a genome that has line one like elements, you and I think there are probably some other lines that can do this too. You end up with a lot of copies of process pseudogenes. They, they, they just were distributed accidentally by the line one machinery. And those process pseudogenes are always built by a repeat model, for example. So you get a whole bunch of uh, housekeeping genes in your uh, raw library. So I don't, I don't have an answer to any of these, of course. I just, I'm, I'm just bringing here the problems that you have to face. <laughs> um, so the ones that are actually accepted, that, are, that were originally the element, they're perfectly fine to me. Of course, they, 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 they should be annotated as TE derived. So the issue here is mostly in the library building, and that's not what we are discussing. Uh, so any any cellular genes that happen to get into the library need to be fished out. Uh, but I have, I, I, you know, this is something to discuss. Should the benchmark really contain cellular genes? Because I think there's going to be some false positives that should not be regarded as false positives in a lot of searches. So false negatives, uh, obviously, Common origin is that they are really, really old. So at that point, at some point, you're not going to be able to see them anymore. Or uh, there are relate elements related to things in your library that are distantly related. You know, they don't even have to be old. They can just be highly diverse matches. I still call that a false, you know, false negative if you don't see it. The fragmentation results in tiny little fragments that you don't have a chance of recognizing a 10 base pair sequence by itself. Uh, that it comes from a, a transposable element. 
uh, you often have that the that you don't reach the end of your model because towards the end there is a deletion or there is a couple of transversions taking place and it gives up before the end. Uh, and then you have this very specific issue, but I if, at least if you use an alignment method, it's a common problem that if you have small transposable elements that insert in very long ones, the the, the, the long alignment will easily jump over your, your small one and it will be annotated as one thing and a little green guy then in the middle will be completely ignored. I call that a small uh, a false negative, could also be a false annotation, of course. Um, so there is many ways in recognize that you, uh, recognize uh, fa false negatives. Um, the thing that the P masker does is that it actually tries to reconstruct an ancestral state in some way by clipping away the simple repeats or insertions inside other TE. So it kind of rebuilds the original status. But of course, comparative genomics is the best way to go after it. And I've been lucky to be involved in the zoonomia project. So we have 238 mammals that are aligned and you can do a ton of stuff with it. This is the picture that you think of course, except that it shouldn't have been duplicated those animals. But if you look at the, so this is the years, we go back about a hundred million years, the placental mammals. So that's quite a bit longer than we just saw the, for the plants. Uh, I suppose that the substitution level in Arabidopsis is higher. Uh, but if you look at the mouse, for example, here all the way, the, the, the fastest evolved genome, this is, this is the amount of substitutions, the, the substitution level since uh, the, the first speciation uh, of the placental mammals is about 40% in the mouse. You cannot, you cannot find anything that is 40% diverged from, a, from, your, from, a, from the original TE se sequence. So what you could do is you, you know, in this process and uh, common ancestors will build, you can take either a common ancestor or you can, t you, some, the common ancestors are not perfectly built. So in many situations it's better to take a species and you know, you have the actual sequence there for that region, uh, take a slow evolving uh, genome like uh, for, uh, uh, for mouse, perhaps a rhino would be a good idea. That's where the rhino is. And for the elephant mouse, an elephant would be a perfect, uh, 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 species to compare to. As long as you have the alignment, you can look at your species, compare it to the ancestral reconstruction. It's already aligned, slower evolved species. It sees more and you can superimpose those things. So on the left here, there was a fragment that you missed because there was an interruption of an of another repeat that made you believe it. This is a completely missed alignment for its divergent. And this was a uh, false annotation, right? You got an insertion and it got extended, but it really was the three prime end of this older element. So we call these things, I'm not sure if it's our own term, we've been calling these ghost repeats, the ones that you miss. And interestingly enough, this is a number from 12 years ago when I first superimposed from the uh, reconstructed uh, Boreo Eutherian genome, I found 400,000 in human and 800,000. Uh, calls in mouse that could be superimposed. So, so lots of missed annotations that are recognized and they could be used in benchmarks. Um, so a benchmark, what you need to do is uh, don't uh, underdo the TE fragmentation if you start for, uh, with uh, in, uh, in silico built uh, TEs uh, and the lesions and you can put in ghost repeats or TE insertions that in silico have been decay to beyond recognition, uh, they need to be part of it. And then there is the much more complex issue of imperfect annotations of trend, uh, so wrong naming basically of things. Uh, so this, the false discovery that happens to overlap of a, a repeat oftentimes is considered a, you know, just a true positive. It is not, of course, you just happen to, <laughs> it happens to falsely match a repeat, 50% of the genome, right? So a lot of the, a lot of the uh, those are actually uh, 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 false uh, positives that happen to them. And so that's something different. Um, you could actually have a um, problem with the alignment itself. The only issue with that is uh, it is not the ideal that I showed in the beginning. And so you end up thinking that the element is much older than it really is, much more diverged. Uh, um, inversions, tandem duplications tend to be a pain in the neck for that. Um, you might not recognize that many different fragments that you see that you actually found 
uh, in the genome are all part of a single insertion. So there's lots of fragmentation happening. Uh, some elements like uh, class two tier DNA transposons have a lot of internal deletion products. So that's very frequent there. Real pain in the necks are the endogenous retrovirus that, that recombine. You know, they, they, they live by, they evolve by recombination. So you have a lot of differently annotated fragments that turn out to be all one thing. If your subfamilies that you assigned to different fragments, say of a line element, it's hard to, you know, call that one thing. The PMASCA does try to resolve those things, but it's a real challenge. And I would consider those all, uh, you know, imperfections in the annotation. This is something that the repeat person never did, but in an, in a future and soon to be released uh, 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 generation of repeat mask, this will be possible. Uh, there is many homologous recommendations. Somebody talked in, in this meeting about how frequent and when we did it, the chimpanzee genome, it was very clear that there is an enormous amount of internal uh, deletions caused by ELU ELU or line one recommendations, and so then you end up in with a, uh, a chimeric element, basically a hybrid. And those can be, uh, yeah, I'm probably way over time already. Uh, <laughs> I am, this is the, yeah, yeah, I've got five, yeah, 18 of 21. So this is almost the end. Um, uh, the, um, yeah, so you can recognize them. Uh, for example, this is supposed to be an element that is specific, you know, it is human specific should be like 99% identical. It's too diverse. That's the first thing that should worry you. Uh, almost all the divergence is on one side. And that really makes you think it's a recombination. And then oftentimes, uh, if it's a, a, a normal recombination, there are no target side duplications. If you have gene conversion, that doesn't count. And then you can go back again in the, uh, in the UCSC browser and indeed see that this, this particular ALU copy was formed after the deletion via homologous recombination between two ALU. So this is actually an ALU SX uh, with an ALU Y, and it is not a very, very exotic ALU Y element that people get very excited about. There is a whole bunch of people that really care about the ALU subfamily uh, assignment. So that is a problem that uh, should be addressed. Uh, there are... Uh, um, yeah, so you get a lot of matches to related, so they are true matches to related, but incorrect TE models. What I see oftentimes, the, uh, a cause of that is that there happen to be a, a mutation, oftentimes gaps, that suddenly makes this distantly related sequence match better. Uh, it, it would join two fragments, for example. Suddenly it becomes one alignment, so the overall alignment scores higher, but it is much poorer. It just happened to have that gap approximately at the same time. So that's very that's a very common reason for others. Are uh, if you have too many uh, uh, non-diagnostic differences in your uh, so this is a library problem again. We face it all the time with ALUs. ALUs are bursting with CGs. And every model, if you automatically make a consensus or a seed alignment, you end up with for all these CPG sites, in one it's called a TG, the next one is a CA, that piles up and you get random copies that align best to this particular combination of CPG uh, mutations, and it has nothing to do with the subfamily anymore. The more subfamily somebody submits to the database or you know, uses in the database, the worse this gets. We got at some point a 2,000 subfamilies for one a, a butterfly sign. So, you know, you come to, you, you're always going to be wrong at some point. It's just, they're not distinguishable anymore. But you have to face that there is a lot of interest in these things. Uh, the incorrect TE may be more complete. Uh, we're all going to work with imperfect libraries. Not, for example, line elements are oftentimes built incomplete. You know, they may not even be present anymore. And so you have a copy that is actually longer it will match better to the model that is more complete than uh, the one that is uh, smaller, even though the similarity is, uh, you know, it's clear when you look at it that I picked the wrong one. Longer simple repeats is also an issue. All the, you know, you add, attach a tail to it and it happens to have a longer tail than the others. It will pick the one with a longer tail. So that's again a library issue, but we also in our uh, forthcoming uh, method 
are able to avoid it even with poor libraries that have these differences. Uh, so this is a little bit more complex, but everybody is uh, familiar with nested TEs. In our genome, the ALUs that like to insert an ALUs really cause havoc. And you have, uh, that's a dimeric element, and all the dimeric elements match a, a single uh, the monomeric elements nicely if they're sitting next to each other. Um, there are libraries, a lot of libraries with artifactual dimeric elements that will always annotate two signs that are happen to sit next to each other they like to to in, insert in the same place right so they are going to be annotated as a double one which is not true uh, there are there's the issue of lines and signs that she has three primaries they are identical so you you know that's a real problem and you don't know until you get to the point where they get specific and then there are mosaic elements they are nightmarish uh, i'll just show two examples in the human genome, you've heard about SVA too, and most of you will be familiar with it. SVA contains not only two ALU fragments sitting next to each other, but also a HERF K, the end of the internal sequence, followed by the LTR. And at this moment, you know, it depends on what run it is and you know the conditions between two and uh, one th and two thousand matches are only to this region. And the vast majority, I think, are going to be false. They should have been annotated as ALUs. This element is an old mule element, uh, active in uh, the ancestor of all primates. And that has also a, this is the Irv L uh, end, so both internal and, and the LTR. In our libraries, the internals and LTRs are separated. So this region actually matches better to a you know, fragment that contains the end of an internal and an LTR. And right now, between 500 and 1500 of the matches are only over that region that matches the uh, LTR region. And that's incorrect too, of course. So you have to install the inserted copies properly and mercilessly. Oh, yeah, this is a whole list of uh, the benchmark uh, to uh, how to make it as hard as possible. I, uh, I think I'm so much over time that problem. No, I'm not. All right. Okay. <laughs> So we are really, uh, Robert is going to, yeah, so Robert is going to talk about this. You can either, you know, pick your uh, uh, known uh, repetitive sequences, and that known is, of course, an issue. It's going to be biased, or you can create your own uh, 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 interspersed repeats. And we are leaning towards that. And if you do that, then you, are, uh, you have to be really aware of how elements evolve. And so the DNA transposers tend to have these internal deletions, which cause problems. LTR elements, they evolve by recombining with each other, which cause problems. You really, you really have to do that. That's, those are the worst. Um, line elements have that, uh, that they have a ex very different rate of evolution. Their, their three prime ends evolves two or three times faster than neutral rate, whereas the coding region evolves very slowly. Um, the American mosaic repeats, as you just show, uh, line and sign pairs, you got to come up. If you make an artificial, you know, an artificial transposable element landscape, you have to think of a lot of things there. Um, and then they have to go in in a natural way. Uh, lines are always five, well, not always, but often five prime triggers. You got all the LTR, LTR recombinations. So yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, target site preferences are sometimes very strong in plants. I think it is much worse even in the mammals, but even in mammals can be a serious issue. Um, they're unequally distributed. You have to unequally distribute them in many different ways. You know, they pile up where the recombination rate is lower, uh, the gene density is uh, also lower, that sort of thing. Adi already uh, brought that up. And then you have to insult the inserted copies in, an, uh, in a natural and neutral and merciless way. Lots of deletions, high substitution rate, tandem arrays. That's the last word, inversions. I think I wanted to type something else after that word. There's a comma there. Yeah. Nice try. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's transposed. There was a word. In... No, it's off the page. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Aria. That was great. Yeah, oh, we're great on time. Yeah. And now we would like to um, introduce someone who's... Sorry. Yes, I did send it to you. Ting Shuan. And she is going to talk about TE genome simile.
Hello, everyone. I'm Ting Xuan Chen. Uh, I jumped this into this TE research world in my PhD and somehow found it too, too interesting to walk away from this field. And now I'm working for plant and food research in New Zealand as a computational biologist. So I hope you guys have been to New Zealand. If you haven't been to New Zealand, please come visit us. Um, <laughs> I'm thrilled to be invited to this workshop to share my work in building this TE genome simulator. Yeah, so this research work is funded by Kiwifu Royalty Investment Program uh, under the Genome Landscapes Objective led by Susan Thompson, and also a program uh, founded by Royal Society Catholic Sitting uh, led by David Shen Ye give me this opportunity to exchange ideas with uh, many uh, international collaborators. And also I would like to show my deep appreciation to my colleagues in the bioinformatics team uh, in plant food research. They gave me lots of inspiration and they have been very supportive. So, um, where is the... Yeah, so some of you have been to my poster uh, about two days ago um, to show how I use the simulator to do some benchmarking work in testing the um, TE discovery tools. So that shows the purpose of building this uh, simulator. Um, and I, my expectation of building this simulator is include some listed here, uh, such as it should be able to simulate a pool of TE sequence from Curiosity T library uh, curated TE sequences uh, with um, generating a um, whole bunch of TE sequences with different levels of sequence diversity and integrity. And I hope that the simulation can include a wide, as wide as possible a variety of TE family sequence, for example, TE uh, family sequence that, that is unique or more present in different species. Also, this simulator definitely should be able to synthesize a genome with multiple chromosomes with different uh, TE insertions within the synthesized chromosome. Um, at the beginning of building this simulator, uh, the capability to rebuild a simulated genome resembling the original one is not the main goal, but definitely we can discuss more uh, after. So where did I start to build this simulator? It started from this publication uh, in 2022, where they developed these uh, scripts uh, called the novel DE eval uh, to generate some simulated genome for benchmarking DE discovery tool. In their scripts, they can uh, randomly synthesize a single strand of uh, sequence based on user-specified GC content, and also simulate uh, TE sequences with different uh, mutations uh, such as substitution, different uh, substitution rates, indels, target site duplication, and fragmentation. And after generating all these TE sequences, their scripts can uh, do random non-overlap TE insertion and then nested TE insertion. But I want to enhance some of the function of their scripts. That's why I built this TE genome simulator. It has two modes. The first one is this random genome mode, which uh, synthesizes multiple sequences as chromosomes based on the uh, CG content and length of chromosome provided by the user. And to uh, generate a whole bunch of T sequences, uh, because we are plant for research, we work mostly on plant species. So here, uh, as an example, I use only the curated TE consensus sequence from model uh, plant model species such as Arabidopsis saliana, rice and maize, and use a TE configuration file to tell the uh, software um, some parameters to do this uh, mutation on TE sequences, such as copy number, substitution index, as I just mentioned in the previous slide. And the second mode is user-provided non-TE genome. We also call it a hybrid mode uh, in short. So what is a non-TE genome? It's processed from a real genome uh, that uh, where the TE sequences has been exotically 
uh, identified by multiple DE discovery tools, or we, we just try, try to over annotate any potential TE sequences from the real genome, mask them with repeat masker, and then remove these TE sequences, giving you these non TE backbones of the genome, and then um, import these non TE genome into the simulator following all the uh, simulation process as I just described, then you will have three output files. The first one is the uh, simulated genome sequence with CE insertions in FASA file. And the second one is the, all the simulated TE sequences in FASA file. And the third one is a GFF file that contains all the uh, coordinates of TE insertions and also some information of the sequence identity uh, fragmentation level. Um, also, whether this TE is a nested TE or whether this TE has been cut by, by a nested TE. To test our uh, simulator here, I use um, a Rhabdopsy Thadena tier 10 as a reference genome. Um, and instead of uh, trying to identify repeats again in this genome by multiple software, I use the standard TE library that is available uh, for tier 10 um, using repeat masker to mask them. And uh, finally, I will get this um, non-TE tier 10 genome imported into the simulator and for the Configuration parts, I use the information, the output file generated by repeat masker to uh, calculate the copy number, substitution level, and so on, based on the output from repeat masker. So I will have uh, a simulation that is more similar to the real genome. Here is an example of the configuration file. So the first column is the uh, TE family in the format of a uh, family name, hashtag superfamily. And of course, there are columns of uh, subclass, superfamily, uh, copy number of TE loci, copy number uh, here, copy number of TE loci of the family, uh, the mean of sequence identity, and here is the standard deviation of identity. Of course, there are some a column for to show in the indels, uh, the proportion of indels to total divergence, and also um, target side duplication length in the format of uh, minimum TSD and maximum TSD separated by comma. And also length of the TE family sequence, the proportion of the TE loci that will undergo the fragmentation simulation step, and also the proportion of the TE loci that are nested insertions. So a simulation on the genome as small as uh, tier 10, it is pretty quick and doesn't take too much RAM. Currently, the simulator can only run on single CPU. And the bar graph here shows the comparison between the original genome and the simulated genome. So the black color represents the original one and the gray color is the simulated genome. So you can see the chromosome lengths in the simulated genome are all much larger than the original one. But in terms of GC content, uh, they are pretty similar, although the simulated one is still a little bit higher than the original one. And here is the uh, pie graph to show the proportion of the genome occupied by TEs. First of all, you can see the genome size are pretty different and the proportion of the genome occupied by TEs is three times larger in the simulated one than the original one. However, if we look at the, this pie graph, the first two shows the um, composition of all the TE loci uh, colored by TE superfamily. They seem to be quite similar. And the bottom two pie graph shows the composition of all TE bases, again, colored by different TE superfamily. 
Uh, and here shows the histogram of uh, the sequence identity distribution in the original and simulated genome. And the y-axis is the uh, TE loss I count. So the distribution seems to be similar. And here is an uh, overlap of this distribution. The blue color is the original distribution and the yellow one represents the simulated genome. So yeah, this seems mm, okay. Um, but uh, one of the biggest difference of the simulated and the original one is the sequence integrity distribution. So on the left hand side, this is the original genome and the right side is the simulated. There are some reasons not, that might contribute to such big difference. Um, first of all, uh, I found that in the original Teratem genome, the annotation from repeat masker contains many small TE fragments that is smaller than 100 base pair. Probably they are the main contribution uh, for integrity between 0 to 0.2. 0 .2. And uh, something that is not shown on this graph is that it's pretty, pretty no normal that the TE annotation is longer than the consensus sequence, especially for full length. Um, LTR root transposons, for example. But I also found there are some repeat annotation that is much, much larger, such as 10 times or 20 times larger than the consensus sequence. And I found that um, many of them are tandem repeat clusters that were merged as one annotation by repeat masker. As for the distribution uh, found in simulated genome, Mainly, this event distribution is contributed by uh, the way we create this fragmentation. So for TE family that is a uh, sequence shorter than 500 base pair, the simulator would randomly pick up a value between 70 to 99% as the value for uh, truncate that TE family sequence. And for family sequence that's longer than 500 base pair, they will randomly it will randomly choose between 40 to 99%. That's why you see this even distribution and also a clear edges at 0.7. So just quickly wrap, wraps up this uh, presentation. This simulator was built to provide a quick, simple question, simple solution for benchmarking uh, TE discovery tools. So I think there's more application that people can try on this simulator. For example, you can, you can customize the TE configuration file to generate genome, for example, that has more TE reason burst activity or another genome that has older TE activity, then you can try to ask different evolutionary questions. Uh, at the current stage, uh, this simulator doesn't consider the insertion preference or whether um, a protein coding gene sequence were removed from the non-TE genome. And also, this simulator, uh, as I said, it uses a simple configuration file to simulate uh, TE mutations but more for a sophisticated approach can be implemented in the future. As you can see, this simulator didn't include, didn't include lots of TE biology, biology as mentioned in the previous talk. And maybe we should uh, consider that um, uh, to implement that in the simulator in the future. Um, as I men mentioned previously, synthesizing an artificial genome Highly similar to the original one was not the main motivation for developing this simulator, but definitely this simulator is a work in progress and we expect to make the scripts publicly available in the future and hoping to extend its functionality and capability and looking for feedbacks from the um, community and collaborations in the future. Yeah, that's me, thank you. Thank you so much, Ding Shuan. It was uh, extremely interesting. And now we're going to have our last uh, speaker before the coffee break, uh, Robert Hubley, who is going to tell us everything about um, garlic, another simulator. All right. Um, today I've been asked uh, to describe the methodology behind the uh, garlic uh, sequence simulator and how it applies to the area of uh, TE annotation benchmarking. Um, first off, oh, all right. 
Uh, first off, uh, this is a code uh, written by um, Juan Caballero um, and back in 2014 while he was at ISB. Um, so I, if I make any uh, mistakes in characterizing his code, I apologize ahead of time to Juan. But um, we have used it extensively for um, uh, touch studies on TE annotation, on also for uh, it's used in DFAM to do thresholding of all the profile hidden Markov models. Um, just an overview of the method at GARLIC stands for generate inter, uh, artificial intergenic controls. The package has primarily two tools, one to take in a genome and a set of annotations on that genome and uh, build a model that um, can then later be used to generate an arbitrary amount of artificial sequences containing um, either true insertions of natural sequence or simulated um, uh, annotations or elements on that sequence. Um, so it, it can generate several different types of benchmarks, um, uh, quite a few different parameters for how you what you want to include in that benchmark. Um, but at the most basic level, you can generate a background sequence similar in distribution to the um, natural genome in isochores and in word frequencies within those isochores. Um, the, you can also further start to put more complex features back into that background sequence, including simple sequence repeats, aka tandem repeats, that are simulated from the what was characterized from the natural genome, from what was handed to it in annotations. Um, you can also um, uh, insert true simple repeats, but we we tend to use the the simulated ones. And that benchmark right there is what we would use for for just doing a false positive benchmark, something where you just want to find what the noise level might be on a particular sequence model in a particular aligner. Um, you can go a step further and then start to um, reintroduce TE sequences. Um, garlic can insert both fragmented full length and nested um, TE repeats that are um, that are similar to the, the uh, realistic ones that were handed to it. Um, so at its basic level, the, so the background sequence for the, for the uh, simulation is done with uh, Markov chains. And the, the novelty that was, in, that was done back in 2014 was that instead of just having a Markov chain for word frequencies, um, they introduced um, a Markov chain of isochores that each contain itself, each state in that chain. For instance, I'm showing here two, where you have transition probabilities uh, from moving from one isochore to another or staying within the same isochore. Um, but each one of those states then encodes a whole separate Markov chain of word frequencies. Um, and so while you're in that state, you're going to emit a whole different pattern of, of word frequencies. The way this is implemented in the code base is actually quite simple. Um, they once your hand once the code is handed uh, the annotations on a natural genome, it removes those. It has the option to remove all of those the sequences to create a a, a, a background sequence, um, and then it it runs a, a window over those that sequence a one KB window, um, non overlapping. And each one of those windows, it characterizes the GC content and starts to build up these tables of word frequencies where next the flanking base next to each word, it uh, creates the distribution of, of nucleotides. It also uh, builds a transition table of these 1K bins um, that are flanking each other. Uh, features are modeled in a similar way to the um, code that we just saw. Um, the attributes of the TEs are stored rather than the TE copy itself. Um, simple repeats the same way. Uh, similar uh, set of attributes, names, orientation on the sequence, um, uh, mutational patterns, fragmentation length, nested frequency, and so on. Um, in addition, it goes a step further and says, we want to also store the information about what is inserted in, in what. Um, and this helps to preserve um, so the, the case where you, you don't want to insert a younger, an older thing inside a younger thing. And so the natural patterns that were observed in the genome are, can be recapitulated by the, by the simulator. Um, 
So then once you have these tables built, they're all saved out to the file system. Um, then the simulator can read these things in, read these tables in and start to do uh, generation of background sequence. It just starts off by picking a, a random word and a random isochore, um, um, starting emitting that sequence and then using the distribution in the table to, to determine the next nucleotide to insert, slides that window over and repeats that over and over again. The only additional step here is that at each point, it can also transition into a new isochore based on the frequencies that it learned. Features are simu simulated in a, a, this is just a, an overview. It, the information that was stored in those tables, features are randomly selected based on the bin that you're going to be inserting into. A consensus is from, of that sequence is, is kept and then uh, simulated by a mutation, a, a copy is made that is, that is similar to the one that was recorded in the tables and then it's randomly inserted. A few more details on on how that's done in um, in garlic is that if you're given a sequence, um, uh, a simple repeat, for instance, it will simulate that sequence from the from the core unit by just uh, making the tandem copies. The a substitution is applied in a rather crude way of 50-50 transitions transversions. Um, and then indels are inserted and it's the same fashion for simple repeats. It's just 50, 50, um, uh, transposable elements. It's a little bit more complex because there's a, a separate indication of deletion and insertion percentage. Um, but also if for transposable elements, you can have these insertions, nested insertions. And so it has to go in through looking in this lookup table to determine the frequency that say a ALU inserted inside an L2 and, and goes ahead and creates those sequences. Um, so back when they published that paper, they, I, I think when it went to review, they had a lot of extra work to do in terms of comparing their output to the natural genomes to prove that they're making something that is uh, complex or similar enough. Uh, their benchmark was meant not necessarily straight for TE analysis, but for annotation in general, gene annotation they were very particularly interested in. Um, so they they uh, uh, analyzed these metrics that I'm showing here. There, there's quite a few complexity metrics. Some of them are um, uh, not uh, uh, are, some of them are 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 basically composition based. So you would expect that, for instance, if you reverse the genome, you wouldn't get a, a, at all a different result. Um, the, for instance, percent AT percent GC are same for both the genome in blue and the dotted line, which is the reversed sequence. Um, however, of course, if you look at um, uh, CPG content, you'll get a, a quite a shifted distribution. Um, the only thing that, that's notable on these graphs for that I've done differently than they did is I added shuffled because uh, shuffled can uh, create a quite a, a different distribution on most of these complexity measures to um, the natural sequence. And for the garlic uh, distributions, most of them have the same sort of distribution shape. Uh, there's often a, a difference in the magnitude or a slight shift of that of that distribution over. Um, you can also look at com uh, linguistic complexity measures. These are plots for word sizes three to six base pair for three different ones, including the Trifonov measure. Um, and again, the similar, they're all very close for, for garlic versus the uh, natural genome. Um, and finally, uh, compressibility. I, I like this measure a lot because it gets um, it gets at the the word content in addition to just the complexity of the words of the word content. So the um, the whether you can actually um, compress the sequence is a measure of that of that whole word space. And so here you can see that the garlic um, benchmark, the green, is slight. It has a similar shape to the uh, natural distribution, but is is slightly less com um, um, complex. There is a um, a shift to the right, so it, it can it can be compressed more. Um, certainly, the the shuffled sequence is is a lot more random. Um, so, how can this be used, particularly for TE benchmarking? This is just yet another uh, depiction of the true positive, false positive alignments 
that you would you would evaluate against your your truth. Um, the only thing I wanted to point out that's a little different is that uh, false positives can be broken out even further into areas I have here, um, this FA and FE. And the only difference here is that in one case, you have an, something that does actually align to the true family, but it overextends. And that so that overextension, we, we call false extension in this case, false positive, false extension. And in this case here, where you have an alignment to, from family A to family B, um, it is an, an alignment that is a false alignment altogether, right? That you don't want, there's nothing there that was true at all. That is that is truly a noisy alignment. And that's a distinctive a, a distinctive effect of alignment program. And sometimes distinguishing those two things helps in evaluating what's causing the false positive. Um, of course, so with this kind of a benchmark, there's a circularity that's, that's inherent. Um, you are you are training your benchmark on a genome, but also on a set of annotations that were probably developed by a tool. And then you're gonna use that benchmark to probably evaluate that tool and others. And so you, you, there's a limitation if you just use it in that form. However, you could imagine that you create an ensemble of annotations from all tools and then build your benchmark and then reevaluate. Then you have a chance at least of other tools out competing your original one. Um, another limitation is that you can only simulate what you already know. And so this benchmark isn't very challenging for unless there's a wide space of differences between tools. Um, so you may want to uh, look at different ways of of generating these these um, TE insertions that might be a little bit more challenging to the tool so that you can quantify at what point they start to fail. Um, and, it, and, and there's other things that could be done to improve uh, garlic. For instance, right now you can't um, you can't ramp up the divergence other than what was already fed it, but you could imagine that's easy easy to parameterize. But you could also you can't currently do forms like recombinants or subfam complex subfamily structures or mosaics um, unless they're already present in the library. Um, Arian already introduced this, so I'm not going to spend much time here. But I I do want to say that back when we did this work on um, ghost repeats. Um, it occurred to us that in, in addition to just pulling that annotation down and using it as a, an annotation uh, pipeline, that it could be used to generate um, these challenges, challenges for a benchmark. So you could insert these sequences back into a background sequence um, to uh, challenge programs that currently have not the sensitivity to find these, these ghost repeats. So that's, that would be one way to, to, uh, to update uh, the garlic method. Another one would be to, we have done some work on um, simulating TE sequences uh, for a, a, another study. We needed to have the ability to really ramp up the, um, uh, the substitution rates and also be able to generate enough sequences to do an, a fair evaluation of multiple sequence alignment methods. Um, we also wanted a more realistic way of simulating indels because um, the current method is just sort of a random number. And so we wanted it to follow a distribution like some of these other uh, sequence simulation programs have done for years. Um, we needed to be able to fragment and we wanted to, um, because we wanted to control the evolution of this element, we wanted it to follow a phylogeny and we wanted to hand it that phylogeny. So we wanted to do a, a full forward uh, simulation. There's many tools to do this kind of thing, but uh, they all lacked one thing or another that we were looking for. So we developed T forward evolve. And so this is com completely for this one study, but I could imagine that this, this could be used for a similar uh, seeding of benchmark. Um, the idea is that you feed it a, a table of um, context dependent uh, trinucleotide rates, um, which may not always be available for your organism. We were lucky we were working in um, um, in human at this point. So we, uh, we just used a mammal table that was developed uh, by UCSC. Um, you give it a phylogenetic tree that you can um, generate. These ones look quite long um, because what we wanted to be able to simulate here was the evolution followed by a long period of decay in a genome. 
neutral decay. So um, these represent our uh, a DNA transposon phylogeny and a line um, phylogeny that we were, were working with at the time. You hand it a sequence, and it can be any random sequence. It doesn't even have to be a true transposable element. But um, we were using TE copies in this case just to be sure that there was some not some natural component of that sequence complexity that we were missing. Um, and then the the program goes through a process of evolving that that sequence along that tree. Um, the other uh, innovation here is that we used um, you know the power power law in uh, for indels and a uh, log normal distribution for fragmentation. And there's options for also doing um, biased uh, fragmentation like you would see in a line family. Um, and that's all I got. I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, I invite you to um, connect on the T Worldwide Slack. I would like to uh, actually thank uh, Rebecca, who's been uh, created this amazing resource. We are more than thousands of researchers and, and uh, people on there. It's, it's amazing. And uh, you will find the T Hub channel if you don't send me an email or someone at the T-Hub, we will put you in there and uh, you will be informed when the next meeting occur. Follow also on the Twitter and the Blue Sky. We will also communicate about that. So, uh, and if you have a doubt, just send an email. You can also through the website, there is a, a, a link to a help email, which uh, several of us will receive and we'll be happy to, to reply. So to uh, move on, and before we have an extended session with our panelists and also other members and just engage in the discussion, we wanted to show something a little bit more concrete, uh, though you will see it's, it's still very prototypic, but it's, it's the concept and the idea. So anything we are going to show you now uh, is not something that you should take for granted. It's just an example. It's very illustrative. Uh, we, you will see, we, we, we pick a few tools to test a few things, but we are not making any choice. So it's very important because we don't want to misguide anything or that any information is given is misguided. So as uh, Johan presented earlier, the general framework to, uh, on which we, we, we are thinking about benchmarking TI notation uh, in, entails three main steps. The first one is using different type of data to generate a gold standard. So a sort of reference to which we think this would be a sort of truth, at least for the context of the benchmark. And so as you've seen today, we have many ways we can do that. One is using simulations, but one could be also, and as uh, Adi presented earlier, uh, using some very well-known genomes, some what I, I wrote here, curated references. You might have better ideas or alternative ideas, so that's why I put other dot, dot, dot here. Uh, so I will present you later um, just an example of this uh, generation of gold standard using uh, garlic that uh, Robert presented. But once again, uh, it's not because it's the best. Uh, <laughs> very important, right? Uh, and then uh, Johan will present you, uh, no, sorry, Jess will present you um, actually the testing of the program. So what Travis was saying, this what happened in the black box. So the different program that are here that you want to test, uh, different parameter that you can use. And uh, Yuan will present you how we are going to, how do we think about evaluating this program? So for the sake of the example here, I've been using garlic. So you just heard about it. Garlic uh, at, at the core use uh, a reference genome in the FASTA format and a curated T library for generating T insertions. So I've been using here the latest um, DFAM for that. Uh, and also you can have other input that are required. For example, a garlic might want to use uh, the gene annotation so it knows what's a gene, what's not a gene to generate this uh, background. So in that case, using uh, garlic, you get this input and you end up with two, file, two, two main files. One is a simulated genome, a FASTA sequence. And the second one is an annotation file. So natively, garlic provides some sort of format. I've uh, transformed it into um, a bed file, I believe. Uh, so for those who are not familiar, bed file is a file with just genome coordinates and at this coordinate, there is this thing. So it's graphically, it would look like that. What I've generated is for different models, I'll show you a background and then we insert different family of T with sometimes some nested family as well as some simple repeat content. So um, for the testing, what we've been doing uh, I've been working using human, the human AG38 reference, 
uh, asking garlic to put 50% of tea in there uh, and 1.5% of um, low complexity repeats. Those numbers are taken mainly from uh, what we know already from, from, from this genome, and it might be more actually, and we talked a little bit about this limitation. Because Robert presented some results on human, I will just focus now for the next uh, um, uh, step on uh, simulation on Drosophila, DM6, with a T content of 20%, 3.1% of uh, simple repeats, low complexity repeats. And I've also uh, done some simulation with uh, Arabidopsis taliana with 20% uh, uh, of TE, as we believe uh, is in there, probably more, uh, and also 1.5% of low complexity repeat. So these numbers aren't very important, just uh, to illustrate that we can do that. Um, Robert showed you actually a few of these metrics, and why showing these metrics is actually once we simulate something or we get a, ground, a gold standard of whatsoever, we would like to, we want to be convinced that uh, it's actually a good one. So using this, for example, the linguistic diversity uh, measurement or diversity uh, metrics, such as the GC content here or the person CPG, you can see that you have some instances here where, well, maybe here in dashed, uh, sorry, it's the reverse genome versus the real genome, are completely identical. The simulation might be a little closer, but for example, the shuffle might have a very different distribution. And depending the metric, you can have also very radically different results. So it's important to think about what do we want in this gold standard? Do we want to reproduce very well the person CPG rather than the GC content? Or do we want both ideally? So it's this type of consideration we can have. We can look at the linguistic diversity also and a, a different value of complexity. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because uh, Robert just, just talked about that. Uh, I would like to uh, maybe intro, so this is the same thing for Taliana, and as you can see, uh, different genome, different background, different distributions. Uh, and once again here, we can assess, okay, in that case, the, the, the simulation might not be that, uh, well, it's just slightly closer, but not exactly identical. But for some metric like the, the person's uh, CPG, you see that in that case, uh, this is the simulation that gets closer to the real genome rather than maybe uh, the reverse genome. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, I wanted also to introduce different uh, type of metrics. Maybe another idea, another way we can assess whether a simulated or a gold standard is close to the real genome, and this could be done using, for example, uh, statistics based on camera diversity. So using a tool called Simca, which analyzing you, you chop your genome uh, ID, like it's it's a it's originally metagenomic tools where you know you just have a lot of short reads. You analyze the camera and you want to know if your different sample looks like each other, if they are the same genome and different genomes. Uh, so you can use any camera size. I used the recommended one of 20 in, in that case, uh, but you, you know, uh, you can do a parameter sweep. Uh, and in that case, for example, using a camera size of 20, analyzing the uh, DM6 or Taliana, uh, and looking at uh, we are looking at here at uh, the, so basically the tool will count the KMER in your data set and you can do uh, statistics based on the presence, absence or the abundance of uh, KMER. Here I'm showing you statistics based on abundance and uh, we can do, so the software will automatically provide you uh, a distance metrics based on this uh, KMER, uh, KMER statistics. And you can appreciate here on the principal coordinate analysis based on these distances using Jacquard distance, but the tool will actually give you, I don't know, 20 different metrics. So you can choose your favorite. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, like explain on the two axis explaining more than 66% of the variation. We have uh, the real genome that is clustered with uh, the with the simulation from garlic. So if, for example, we had to choose between uh, garlic, shuffled or reversed, one might think, and um, let's take some precaution here, right, that this simulation is closer than the real genome rather than the shuffled or the reversed. Results are quite similar with uh, Taliana. However, this is a way to look at this result. The same way to look at this result is to look at this cladogram based exactly on the same distance. And as you can appreciate, the branch are very long, meaning that between the simulated and the real genome, there is still a lot of distance. So it's not perfect. And so the goal would be to use these metrics as the other one that I presented before, but also any other way to compare a uh, gold standard to the real genome, try to thought out of uh, how our different um, way to general gold standard diverge from or are distant or not from the, the reality. So 
once again, this is uh, very, um, okay, this slide should not be there. So the, <laughs> this is just a way to illustrate that we can sim uh, simulate or to at least generate grand truth data for different models with different parameter, choosing the amount of T, the amount of uh, a low complexity repeat, uh, and so on. Um, so this was very illustrative. I'm gonna skip these two slides because next uh, Jessica is gonna tell you what you do once you have generated a, a gold standard. So I'm going to be very brief because I would like to save as much time as possible for the discussion. Uh, but the but the main idea, uh, these the two annotation tools that we chose because you're most familiar with them. I used to work with Robert and Arian. I'm very familiar with, believe it or not, Repeat Masker. So the idea was to test if Repeat Masker and, and TENA, a part of Repet, could successfully run on these simulated genomes just to make sure everything was formatted properly. So I tested both uh, two different kinds of runs with repeat masker. I don't have the results here, but they ran successfully. It was great runs for for all for all of the genomes. So I don't have the results here because we didn't have the evaluation scripts. Just because it ran sex su successfully to completion does not mean it's like where the repeats were nested repeats. Evaluation scripts would be nest would be needed to to really see what's going on there. But I used, um, the, these are the settings that I particularly use. I also used uh, 32 threads, so PA32, which I did not put up here. But uh, essentially, I use sensitive settings, dash lib, and also dash species, because they do run slightly different. Dash lib and dash species run slightly differently, actually very differently in repeat masker in, ter in terms of staging. Dash species is much more complex and actually will, uh, I know Arian uh, talked about this earlier, talking about uh, cutting, uh, having like, cut libraries so you can get those older repeats that actually um, uh, get the full repeat, actually get to the entire thing uh, versus dash lib, which is much more simplistic. It's really uh, young, simple repeats, the entire library altogether competing, and then old, simple repeats. So just uh, pretty basic staging. Uh, but the other, uh, the other is much more complex in terms of also separating out I, I, uh, the internal portion of LTR, just the LTR DNA elements. Um, there's a special stage for ALUs, just if you're using heat primates, just for example. Okay. Um, so the output of repeat masker works really well uh, with what we already have set up. So no format changes are required. However, with the ANOT, there are um, some formatting things that are required to get it to work properly. And I would really appreciate it if Johan could help <laughs> with those specific scripts. Uh, yes, in fact, as uh, I'm more familiar with the uh, not, uh, <laughs> I run on the uh, not. And uh, just as a reminder, in fact, uh, not is, uh, is a pipeline that is using uh, different tools, which are uh, sensor, repeat masker, and blaster. And uh, in fact, uh, yes, uh, we, uh, if we uh, need to use the output of uh, garlic, there is a, a step uh, to, to make it uh, compliant with Repet. Uh, and uh, uh, so fortunately, there is already a script available to uh, format the, 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 the input file to be compliant with uh, Repet. And um, <clears throat> uh, it was interesting to, to cite that to um, illustrate the fact that, uh, for example, if we uh, plan to uh, make the uh, all-in-one uh, wrapper that can uh, keep together the three step of uh, a benchmark, so uh, getting the, the reference genome, the tools, and the metrics, we need to get this kind of script to, to get the, 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 the full process. And uh, yes, uh, we uh, do a bit of uh, auto promotion uh, with uh, citing the. We just copy paste uh, the 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 comments line coming from the training uh, uh, support that we produce from from the 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 first uh, tier workshop in Uppsala, and you also have the QR code for the video. Uh, and uh, we don't, but we could launch uh, other tools to uh, test the annotation, like uh, Blaster, Sensor, Minimap, and uh, Asher that uh, Adi just talked before. And then the, the, the third step is the evaluation process, uh, for which we need to get a sensitivity and a specificity. 
And uh, in fact, uh, you may have seen from the guest speaker that it's not uh, an easy concept. In fact, function of how you uh, uh, define this concept, it could vary a bit. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, you, we could uh, uh, evaluate the false positive at the base level or at the copy level. But uh, if we evaluate at the copy level, we may have to define a cutoff in terms of identity between the, uh, the reference and the, uh, the, the annotation of the tool. Uh, and maybe there are other metrics. In fact, uh, they are from uh, uh, the uh, uh, Robert uh, talk uh, that uh, I show here. And uh, maybe other one uh, from which we don't think about, but maybe you have uh, other ideas. <clears throat> and uh, so here is just a few points that uh, I uh, highlight that uh, could uh, be improved uh, in terms of um, the way to uh, use the benchmark. So for example, in our uh, approach, we uh, use a genome size of uh, uh, 25 uh, megabases for Taliana and uh, Drosophila. Drosophila. And uh, it could be uh, too short to be a discriminant between the, the tools, or uh, we could um, vary the uh, complexity of the insertion, number of copies, uh, the degradation of copies, in fact, uh, I, I, if I understand well, in fact, the, the garlic may be able to do that. And uh, uh, another way to uh, improve the, the, the concept could be to insert some uh, genes uh, in the fake genome, even if uh, we have seen in the talk of uh, Adi that uh, uh, there are some limitations in this approach. Uh, and that's it. In fact, it's just a few points that uh, we could uh, discuss and it could be a starting point from the discussion that is coming uh, now. Uh, so now, if you have questions from the guest talk, it's time for that. I don't know if I okay. it right, but you were suggesting that uh, considering any uh, T annotation inside the gene, is it the coding video by gene to consider the false positive? Yes, it's one way to 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 assess for false positive. But as I as I show you, I think it's not the best solution. It's 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 a simple way to do. But what 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 is important to me, in fact, is that about false positive, false negative, and all these things is that in fact is to compare relatively the value. The absolute value is not really meaningful for, for me. What is important is to be able to compare. So if, if, even, if you, even if you underestimate or overestimate the false positive, in fact, because you have this, uh, um, this correlation that show you that, in fact, uh, it goes in the same direction, comparing the different tools, you will not have difference in the performance in the tools, in fact. OK, in, in this very quick, let me know what? Why do we keep separating the LTR parts from complete ERVs or LTR elements? <laughs> <laughs> That's probably as in <laughs> that was not for AD. <laughs> well, the main reason is that uh, I'm a human again, and so in the human genome there are many LTRs that we don't know the internal sequence for. So, and then, yeah. And so then if you all, you know, for the ones that you know, if you put them in, they always will outcompete the ones that you don't have, and, you know, you only have the LTR for it. Uh, it's not so difficult, actually, to bring them back together. So that's not really a, not really a problem. I think when you define that, you say it, it's a, a community thing where people have been uh, running tools uh, independently and then uh, where all the information was uh, brought back together and, uh, and, and curated. And then in your talk, you, you were showing the, the base T annotation, which is for me not at all curated because several labs have been annotated uh, with different tools. And so I'm just wondering uh, where we go there. When, when do we say if we have a curated annotation that we can trust for? Uh, because for me, the, the uh, there is some sort of uh, kind of balance between the the real and real annotations that have been done and simulating and i think both of them have uh, issues and we may want to do both of them 
And so I, I wonder uh, how can we trust, uh, at, what, to, at which point we can trust the TI notation that we have in our hands. Never. <laughs> yes, never. In, in, in fact, yes, an annotation is just a, a view at the moment uh, on the genome, and uh, this view can evolve according to the knowledge we gain on the genomes, on TEs, on tools, and so on. So you have to keep in mind that any annotation is never the truth, the absolute truth is just a, a view of the genome at the moment. So uh, saying that, I, I think that the, uh, what you have to focus is to avoid the, the bias and the bias is to, to, re to test your tools on the tools that have really, that has been the only tools to, to provide the, the reference annotation. So at least using several, combining several annotation to provide your reference annotation is probably the, the best way to do, and it's probably possible for the maze. Yeah, for the maze genome, that are, that there is no real community effort for that uh, so far. So maybe there will be, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I have a question for King Chen, a very practical question. In your configuration file, you chose go for identity between uh, family or subfamilies. I was wondering uh, how did you compute that score? Uh, thank you for your question. The sequence identity was calculated very in a very simple way. It's just a substitution rate plus indel rates. And that combines a sequence divergence, and then the identity is 100% minus uh, substrated from that sequence divergence. Yeah. Uh, do you provide uh, files with pre computed scores for different species? Oh, I didn't provide that kind of score. Um, for my presentation, that compare that using a Rhabdopsis. Tier 10 genome as an example and showing the comparison of simulated and the original genome. Um, the, um, the, um, the sequence divergence that are uh, sequence identity and indel rates that I put into the configuration file is based on the output that I get from repeat masker. So that is my standard of building that configuration file. And then but then the generation of those substitution and indel is random. So I didn't show, I didn't include like whether we, um, whether we apply different mutation rates at different region of a TE family uh, for that simulator. So the simulator is per reason, uh, at the moment it's a very uh, simple, naive model just to provide a quick, simulated genome. Um, and the the purpose of building this simulator is because we work a lot on non-model species and really we don't have the curated libraries for those species. Even I annotate those new newly generated genome assembly using multiple different TE discovery tools. I I don't know which one to choose because they all very different. And so building a T simulator is uh, just to, to give us a quick idea about how different tools perform. It is hard to judge which one's better, but definitely we using simulator, we can know that how they perform differently in different, from different perspectives. The, uh, the, the the in the table for the P mass, so you get this the divergence level, right? So I, I'm thinking if you are just saying okay, I need fifteen percent substitution to the sequence, then it's still probably okay. But if this is something thirty, then there's actually many more substitutions that have taken place. They are going to superimpose, right? So you need a, the Kimura distance really. That that is the number of substitutions that you need to add. Otherwise, you make it too easy again. You don't get the same divergence level. 
Uh, so I have a uh, one question regarding the like purpose of this uh, benchmarking because it is uh, it seems to be my understanding is that all points to the more like sim testing uh, similarity based methods that you are not really targeting structure based annotation because you are really not dealing with the mode of the reproduction of these uh, elements. Uh, so this is my one question: if you really like. Your intention is to develop this benchmarking purely for uh, similarity-based annotators. And the second, uh, I want to like point that I think that if we will have a limited number of the gold standards, so that will lead to overfitting our tools. So how to avoid this this problem? Does this wit does work? Uh, so regarding the first question, I, I think there are a couple of important points with this. One is that what we've just heard a description of is an example of a particular sort of benchmark that one could create, right? Which is benchmarking for annotation. Uh, in my uh, my attempt at a description of the the general goal uh, with the with TE Hub support for for development of benchmarking, it is. Uh, to first treat the method with which annotation is achieved as an absolute black box. So for example, if you if there is a method that isn't library based or similarity based, but but identifies elements by some other mechanism, then that's the magic that lives inside the black box. So uh, let me let me say a couple more things and then for sure uh, you'll you'll have more to say. The second thing really important is, um, this is just one example of an annotation. If there are uh, annotation benchmark, if there are alternative, different sorts of annotation issues that should be benchmarked, then a different benchmark or collection of benchmarks could be built to address those alternative issues. And then, of course, as Yuan mentioned earlier, there are so many other things that sorts of analyses that can be performed that should also be benchmarked ranging from identification of families in the first place to uh, to uh, to accurate recognition of of, uh, of of polymorphism or structural variation or whatever. And each one of those issues requires, if you're building tools, which many of us have done, requires some kind of intelligent and careful benchmarking, which we'd prefer over time become part of the of a collection of centralized benchmarks that are useful to the community rather than each one having to be built from scratch uh, by a particular tool developer and so that's partly uh, a, a, an answer to the to come to the question one and the question two is I totally agree if you only have one benchmark or even a small number of, of simulated genomes or otherwise overfitting is always a problem right every test is useful until every until the developers of methods begin to build methods to the test. And so the real challenge, I think, is building a collection that are diverse enough that they actually sort of represent what's what's hard about uh, about the method so that these methods are are generally useful even outside of the benchmarking. So, and there, I don't, I'm not sure what happened. But there's... Uh, that if what we're gonna do is for each question. If all the panelists oh, wants to answer first, and then just the microphone. Anybody have something else to say? Possibly be as eloquent as you. Uh, just maybe one thing to to add for the for the diversity of uh, bench not benchmark but. Uh, genome for benchmarking to not overfitting the tools. I think the best solution is that everyone can pro can generate uh, his uh, test genome. I think we have to move on, on this direction, either by simulation or by other approaches to have a way to provide uh, the user uh, a, a way to simulate, to have a genome to test uh, the tools that is the close, closest as possible to the to the species he is working on, in fact. So if a simulated genome, for example, uh, a way to be able to simulate a genome very close to the genome that you are working on, for example. Right. No, for the back. <laughs> so I totally get how all of us work on different systems. Many of us made different tools that work really well in our systems. 
and so we'll need a suite of benchmarks but is there any kind of strategy or consideration to make sure we don't end up just with a complete overflow of different <laughs> benchmarks to the point where we have so many that we have the same problem that we have a benchmark for every tool and we just kind of overflow with our methods basically my my answer is, to the question of whether there is a plan to uh, herd the many cats that uh, that are at risk of running rampant in this process, the answer is not exactly. This is it's pending, right? So this is it's a it's a matter of time on task. People need to be able to the I'll call it the curation team, right? Needs to be in place in order to really develop the the interface with the community to to ensure that we're building these things up correctly. And it turns out that a curation team can either be composed of volunteers who have very little time to work on things or funded folks uh, who then have time to do it. And we're waiting for the funding to arrive in order to really get that nailed down, which is not much of an answer. My question about that is selecting the ground truth step, the first step of benchmarking. So how to make sure like it's, it's actually ground truth set because it's also derived from another tool and we are not sure about the other tool, how precise it is. You know, you, 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 yes. <laughs> like Hadi assumed that he knew the ground, uh, the truth. So that, that is the advantage of doing a completely simulated genome, right? Then you know the ground truth. The problem with doing a simulated genome is that you're going to have to assume that you know how things evolved, right? What the actual patterns are. So you get away from the natural situation in that way. So the benefit of an approach where you think you know everything because you studied it for so long is that they are actual, the real things that, uh, that you see in a genome, but there is going to be false positive, uh, false negatives there are plenty. And uh, uh, yeah, probably also uh, the library is incomplete. So you don't, you, you know, you assume this is what it is, but it, it could have been in a different origin. So yeah, that's really a uh, big difference there. Yeah. Any... yeah. Can I ask one more? Yeah. Okay. So if we are using simulated data set, let's say from human genome, um, and human reference genome is based on Caucasian, Oh. how we can make sure like if we are using it for different population this actually yeah. it covers all the population yeah so for the e annotation that impact is very small fortunately but if you of course if you study uh, polymorphic polymorphisms then that is important yeah so i don't have much experience in that but i yeah, so there is going to be a pen genome that will be that will be the 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 thing to work with. Yeah, that's not my expertise though. No. It, it's all great. It's a great initiative and good discussion. I am concerned. So I've seen benchmarks in other systems. There's the genome in a bottle for variant called, and despite the intention. I think there was a problem there that the dominant technologies led to the benchmark standard and then the dominant technologies perform best on it. And yep. Hadi's comment that using different tools, you know, helps avoid that isn't really true if all the tools try and copy each other to perform better, <laughs> which is what happened in that situation. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, do you have a solution? It's a negative factor, in fact, in that community. Yeah. So, so hmm. that's one comment. So we should just be aware of that. Uh, I'm not sure that the consensus of all the Currently, best thought of tools is always the best thing. The second comment. I'm sure it's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The strong bias is helpful yeah. also its publication. But uh, I'm really I'm struck by the, the ghost approach and the phylogenetic. It's not very new. <laughs> no, it's not. But I, as a comment, I feel that the whole field should, in fact, do all its TE annotation in a phylogenetic context. Yeah. No, that's what I've been saying for years. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, you know, we shouldn't, I'm involved in making new genomes. I think we shouldn't be trying to write, construct new de novo family sets for new species and then use single genome annotation tools. So in a sense, this blows the whole discussion out of the water. I'm sorry about that. But, but I think that as a community, we should, we, should, uh, we should try to 
because you know increasingly there are very few genomes which are unrelated to any, something else which uh, and i think we should think about how to annotate in a phylogenetic context yeah yeah this has been on my uh... I've probably written it in three or four grand proposals already, you know, to actually in, integrate the super of the alignment of genomes in the annotation. It's not that straightforward. <laughs> and so, so yeah, so we, yeah, so the, the next version of repeat mask is not going to do that yet, but there is an aspect to it that makes it possible to actually uh, assess this information comes from another genome. Am I going to copy that annotation or am I going to trust, you know, the annotation that you get uh, directly from your genome? So, yeah. so this is specifically about the annotation benchmark. So, so it's discussed in, with simulated data sets, so it's a discussion about how, you know, how distant to make things. But I think, you know, really valuable is to make a whole set of different distance divergences, both in terms of fragmentation and, and substitution. And, and the, and, uh, I would like to see reported, not just an F like an F1 or, but, 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 uh, you know, how does performance degrade with distance, uh, measure? I think in some sense, that's, that, that is going to be a significant thing that some methods may be very accurate on things that are close, which is a valuable thing, you know, and uh, and some may be more sensitive for distant things, and I think there are different parts of the space to to um, to look at. And so allowing people, you know, not having a single measure, but allowing tools to specialize on different things will actually help enrich things rather than have everyone go after this one measure, which they incrementally improve by 0.5%. Um, so, <laughs> uh, which is a bit pointless. Uh, yeah so yes uh, on, on the same line also i think it could be very useful to have the the performance assessed by uh, type of family i i suspect that uh, some tools perform well on uh, ltr element and other uh, perform better on mites uh, things like that not only there is the, the issue with the divergence of these families but also the, the way they evolve are, are different uh, so we have some pattern of evolution that are different and there is a, some structural component inside this element also that may may, may be uh, a, a problem for some tools and not for other and things I, I think we should have this uh, information um this reminds me of bio nlp comparisons where um the they they do an evaluation at the end and, and some of the entities that they recognize you can it can be one or the other and kind of both are correct and i wonder arian's talk alluded a little bit to that that sometimes the 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 what happens if five different methods predict another uh alu type but they're actually right right it's at some certain of it's a, at some level of distance and the same what what richard said that uh, since these i guess that's a relatively easy case here of simulated data and the library is given so people fight at 0.5 percent and at that level sometimes in buying nlp competitions you can win it by just by just force your results in certain directions because you know that the, the simulators do something um so at a very high level uh, of similarity between the methods who is going to decide if the simulator is right or the or the or the predictors i guess arian <laughs> as usual <laughs> or, or or something there's a there's an edge. This could be a battle in the gray zone, and the gray zone, I guess, will also need some some sort of manual creation. Just a comment about manual curation. I'm a bit worried that when you see the number of genomes that are generated, how will we handle manual curation? At some point, uh, I think. It's, uh, so right now, and at least what I'm doing to kind of. I'm kind of I'm kind of responding. At least what I'm doing manually. I don't know what Arian's doing man for manual curation, but essentially, uh, there's multiple, uh, like, multiple. Uh, uh, right now, I'm working on multiple different projects, and there's uh, if there's nice overlap, and with with all of the different genome projects, I'll get a really nice library that represents uh, the most species for like a, a two or three 
and then at least from there you can use some phylogenetic comparisons to get the, the true live uh, more expanded library to what uh, Richard Durbin was talking about but it's not it's intractable right we can't do um, a manual curation for every single genome uh, that comes out and it's really unfortunate that we can't spend that level of time on everything uh, because I feel like there's going to be the, the divergence of TEs are going to be way off. Uh, we're going to miss novel families if we're just doing pipeline stuff, which I know is way off the board topic of what we're <laughs> talking about. But yeah. Uh, just uh, want to say that uh, even if uh, there are many tools for automated uh, annotation, in fact, now there are also many tools for uh, improve these uh, uh, automated annotation. Uh, and uh, there are guidelines, obviously, for uh, do it uh, manually, but there are also a lot of uh, tools to do it uh, uh, after the uh, automated uh, uh, annotation. And in fact, it's also a, a part of the TIA project is to uh, try to connect a bit more the different tools involved in TIA annotation and maybe to make it more interoperable. That's it. So it's a way to... Uh, avoid a lot of uh, manual curation work in fact uh, that's right it's a really a lot of work and it's hard to uh, uh, federate the community to work on that for time so uh, hopefully we we try to make it better i mean the inter interoperability of tools so one thing i think that's going to be quite important with benchmarking that i think would be nice to be quite transparent is often so you get your scores, which is great, but there's quite a significant difference between, for example, like a 99% hit score of you hit 99 out of 100 TEs compared to hitting 100 TEs, but never actually hitting them perfectly. So to take into account the fact that your true positives might need to be kind of expanded above one singular number to be like, okay, we got this many copies, but actually how good were you at hitting each individual one? And for that to be visible, I think would be quite important for, for benchmarking methods. Maybe an aspect we haven't talked about is how to propose the different workflows. And there has been initiatives at the European level, like Workflow Hub. I'm thinking also about the SnakeMake catalog and the NF core collection. Um, what do you think about the way um, the community should go regarding this issue of diversity of formats and maybe to propose some solid standards people should respect to provide some uh, benchmark pipelines? Before I respond, I'd be interested in your thoughts. <laughs> okay, do you, do you have three hours? But um... we, we do have a, a URL into which you can write as many thoughts as you have, and they will be re received and appreciated. Okay, uh, so <laughs> to be quick, uh, we have worked on that a lot at EMBL. We have a, a work stream on a workflow. And I think that's very important to um, use what is existing in the next flow and SnakeMay community because they put a lot of thought and the benefits uh the benefit of this is uh to simplify usage by respecting the um, how do you say uh linting uh script and uh, the catalog reference um if there is uh an incentive from T Hub to ask people to respect that standard, uh, it can be extremely beneficial, I think. I think that's a great suggestion. 
I don't have a lot to add right now. I think it, it, it's important that we have a a well structured uh, collection of both benchmarks and captured competitor containers. And I think you're right to uh, to to suggest that we uh, insist that these follow reasonable standards, both in terms of how they work and also how they are designed to make it easier for others to be able to to stick their hands into them and either make suggestions or adjustments, but also to, to plug uh, plug variants uh, into, the, into the infrastructure. And I think that the, the answer is yes, it's a great suggestion. If you want to uh, help to write something for the GM uh, website, I'll be happy to show you what we have done at uh, MBL. Uh, uh, I am absolutely ecstatic to get help doing that. So uh, please do follow up by uh, submitting just a brief description of, of your willingness to participate on the, the link that uh, that come on has already posted or will uh, send in an email yeah. and we'll take advantage of it. This this is true for everybody, right? This is a volunteer it's effort. This is uh, anybody who wants to volunteer and contribute to this, your assistance is gratefully received. Since I don't see someone else waiting, um, so one of the pos you know one of the advantages of this is potentially to kind of help standardize on what the outputs of these tools will be, and there's an advantage of that, uh, you know, in that then all the users can switch between them, um, but of course you know different tools will have different things that they think they want to do, so I don't know where the field has got with that. I mean, I guess. GFF3 with sequence ontology is something, but is there discussion about actually what it is that you want to annotate as, as the output of an annotation? Uh, you know, the internal structure, which part of the, have you found, do you want internal parsing of the element, description of how it diverges from the consensus, you know, family, subfamily, there's all sorts of questions. So this is a kind of open question for me, slightly as an outsider. Uh, the simplest thing is just a, a bed file of the endpoints, but uh, yeah, I mean, and I guess there's a default, de facto standard of what repeat mask produces, but is that the right thing? Maybe we have an opportunity to have some say into what that should be, and people in the room have an opportunity, not me. I expect that that sort of question to be part of, of future polling. Right, I think it's a it's an important. Yeah, but if there's somebody here who has a strong view, oh, it's right, right now it's a strong view. One extra thing I, I, w I would just like to add when thinking about the the value of of establishing benchmarks that that provide a frame a very clear framework for what input looks like and what output looks like is it's also an attractor to new tool developers, folks who may may come from outside of a community uh, who already work on this kind of thing. If it's a relatively straightforward matter of recognizing oh all i have is that all i need is this input in this output format right and i i have idea computational ideas that may be useful right it's it's a much lower lift to be able to enter a field and and provide alternative approaches to solving problems and this is one of the motivations behind building this kind of benchmark infrastructure is to simplify entrance to the field by new idea generators in in fact the the question of standards has been already discussed in the framework of this T hub uh, in a different context. In fact, there is a, a space, I think, in, in the T hub uh, wiki where we have a place to describe some standards uh, as a nomenclature or something like that uh, on ontologies used for a transposable element. So it's, it's true that, in fact, the, the, the question of uh, evaluation of tools also raise the, case, the question of what are the important information that our annotation tool should provide. This is something that uh, of obviously could be a part of the evaluation software, of the evaluation of the software, and, and also something that we have to, to think about uh, what are the minimum information that we need to provide 
when we annotate the genome. We have some ideas. Uh, I, I'm sure that we that we converge on on these ideas, but maybe we have to formalize this more clearly. Hello. So, according to my knowledge, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the different copies of the same TE family won't evolve in the same manner. It depends on where they were inserted in the genome, so they will be under different selection forces. So if TE has been co-opted or inserted in, for, for example, in house region, it must be more uh, preserved, conserved than other TEs. And I was just wondering how much do we take into account this functionality of the regions uh, to annotate TEs or to, for example, found the consistency sequences of transposable elements? I think this is an example of a great question where where there, there aren't a, f a lot of answers. I think you put the your finger on something that is critical and that should be uh, what, a little bit like what Arian was saying earlier is like we need to put some biology in the um, in a way of developing uh, the benchmarks and, and ground truth, right? So um, the way I see it, the the you can model things and but there's only every uh, so much things you can think of. So it's very good that you make this remark because we could, for example, benefit from a lot of knowledge from uh, functional biologists uh, that are epigeneticists that have been, you know, working a lot on understanding what will make a cop uh, what will make a given copy being either expressed or even uh, uh, transposed later. And uh, I think there are a few things that that already exist. There are a few little things that, for example, uh, Robert presented the fact that uh, in the um, T evolve the, the forward evolution uh, evolution model, where just considering if you consider DNA transposons or, or uh, retrotransposons, just the pattern and the, the the evolution will be different. But what you suggest is an extra layer, even uh, considering functionality. So, indeed, it's it's uh, it's great to keep in mind. I think it's extremely advanced and and complex, but it's. I think it would be a fantastic PhD thesis uh, project, for example. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a great, a great, and just uh, so you know, everything we say now is going to be recorded, but please, please, um, we will share the link where you can add all these suggestion because we will sort them out, organize uh, by, you know, different topics and different ID, whether they are very functional for the development of the benchmark or they are more, uh, let's say conceptual uh, concepts, things that we should always keep in mind, and and, and this type of things. Well, you, you are right, and I, I think we 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 need to also benchmark on true genome and not only on uh, random genome for this reason. So I, I, I suggest strongly that uh, we should use a random sequence, a random genome. I think it's a, a good way to assess some specific. Uh, a feature of, of the tools, but we also have to test on uh, real genomes, such as we did for Arabidopsis thaliana, maybe to improve the, the, the way we did this by inserting, uh, we insert for the moment random sequence uh, to, to assess the false positive. There is probably a better way to, to do something like that, maybe to, to have an approach that is closer of a random genome and simulated genome, in fact. But I think we we need to to not only focus on on, on this simulated genome, but also on, on on a true genome for this reason. For all this reason, maybe we can only just add of uh, the sequences of enhancers that are annotated, for example, in multiple databases like Quantum Five database for each genome in the simulated genome to to see whether we are able to find the TEs that have been implicated in development of these enhancers. So it's a daydream to add more um, information in the uh, thing, you know, not just the alignments, but we are thinking in DFAM to add information on where known enhancers or initiation sites are in the model, at least. And it would be great if it can be transferred over to the annotation. I don't see how yet, but that is something that I think can be. Uh, in order to stay on time and that everybody, because, you know, the, they're going to close the building at one. Um, and once again, you have to pick up your picnic boxes. <laughs> uh, ask Rita for that when, you, when you'll exit. Maybe we can focus now the next questions and broaden the, the discussion about maybe 
uh, ideas and whether you would be also willing to provide uh, to lead future benchmarking efforts uh development efforts and in uh, in other topic or bring to the table uh other topics that uh, could be handled through the context of the the chi hub if you want to you can also kind of start an open chat on the te hub website like it's kind of like a questions or like a, almost like a blog going back and forth <laughs> If if that's kind of the interactive way you would like to do things, I know I have the free version of Slack. So after so many messages, things get deleted. Um, so you can also uh, post things on to eHub. Get a specific question, maybe that'll and so we'll keep that um, kind of track of that conversation. Also, as a reminder for what I said for to eHub, you know, propose a topic if you're if you don't feel like um, if everyone's a little shy at the moment, maybe propose something on slack and we can have a have a meet t hub meeting about it yeah very importantly t hub is not just the people that have been talking so far it's the community and uh, if just jumping on what just say if you feel like you you have strong idea and especially motivation uh, i think it's uh, and, and a little bit of time on your hands uh, don't hesitate to jump in and be like hey i want to lead a discussion on uh, how to do that and that and those who wants to let's have regular meeting as long as the discussion exists and is available for everybody, that would be that would be great. Also, in the future, uh, you know that all the discussion are on 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 the Slack right now, and as just you were saying, are quite limited. Um, we have a plan to try to move all this discussion to a sort of built-in board type of things, where discussion can be, you know, uh, about stay forever and and also be uh, shareable and linkable. So. Uh, rest assured that this is in the works and also if you want to help with that and have an idea about that reach out to to us and and, and jump in the conversation so yeah once again uh we, we have a little bit of time so please if you have ideas questions suggestion uh maybe we cannot go into the nitty-gritty of uh, everything but uh and i see you want to say something no, no just i wanted to uh complete uh, what you say and uh, uh... I guess that uh, uh, maybe leading uh, another group on uh, uh, another benchmark could be a bit uh, hard to decide. And maybe a first step is if there are some people who are uh, interested in uh, working on other benchmark, but uh, a bit uh, uh, don't want to be really uh, the leader for that. Maybe just create a, a Slack group and to to find uh, other people that are interested also and together. It's the starting point to 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 work together. So maybe there there is no need for a leader right now. I guess just a discussion group. So don't be shy. Perhaps the word here should be contribute, as opposed to lead. If you want to be engaged and be a part of a group that is uh, addressing these alternative uh, annotation or not annotation, not annotation benchmarking efforts, other things aside from what we've been talking about so far. Yes, I have a question about, uh, ah, yeah, sorry. So we uh, uh, talking about the, uh, the, the benchmarking from the whole genome uh, T annotation level. Do we exactly need to benchmark uh, T annotation from the consensus uh, T library? For example, uh, to see if the, to see the integrity from the consensus uh, uh, library, just like uh, the method from uh, the repeat model two paper. But I think that that is great, but it's still not perfect. We need to develop another method for doing that. Yeah, I think you're you're referring to to a benchmark that would be for a de novo method in particular that you're evaluating its ability to to recapitulate the library. Is that my understanding? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That that that's almost a whole completely different um, benchmark, um, and it has its own challenges. That, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. If, if if you simulate a genome, you put your, you know, you would know what you put in. The ideal right. library builder, you know, spits out the ones that you started out from, of course. So, it's, it's uh, they are definitely overlapping. Can... I, I just uh, wanted to talk a little bit on, on helitrans. Uh, we've been bumping on helitrans for different reasons. I mean, when we work on genes, we find helitrans that overlap gene annotation. So we don't know whether it's a helitrans with piece of a gene or a gene with a helitrans insertion. And uh, it 
I'm not a healthy trend person, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure where we are there, but I, I was, um, it seems to me that there are lots of false positives uh, in the healthy trends annotation. And I was wondering how we can um, uh, in, improve the, maybe the manual curation. I, I don't know, maybe we need to, uh, now that we have uh, RNA six and things, like, maybe maybe there are some data we can integrate so that we can pull out the real helitrans from the genes. Uh, so uh, we have some data sets that we, I mean, we've been once again we've been bumping into that, uh, and we would like to discriminate them from the real genes that we're working on, but. Um, so we may uh, participate a little bit on that, but uh, I think if um, some other people want to uh, do that, that may help. You're working with maize, right? So there's an intense community that is trying to make a really good database. It sounds to me like there are many helitrons that have incorporated uh, cellular genes. And so, yeah, I've been worried about, you know, repeat model or creates all kinds of things that match real genes. I did develop a method where I eliminate uh, the most commonly pseudogenized genes by collecting all the uh, profiles of housekeeping genes, screen for that, eliminate that. That's the only thing I've done so far. It's not yet implicated in the repeat model. It goes a bit far to compare every element to the entire database. Uh, so, so uh, you could do that, goes a bit far, and then compare it to the uh, the TE library of proteins at the same time. And if the TE library gives better results or similar results, then you keep it. And otherwise, you toss out, you mask the model in your case, because it is a good model otherwise. But it, you know, that's a really big problem. I have a much more general response to the question, which is that this, I think this is a really good example of it's still an annotation question in a way, although it's also a library construction question, but it is a very focused kind of a question, right? So uh, in some ways, I think it can be tempting to think, oh, a benchmark should test everything. But a benchmark doesn't have to test everything. You, we can have small benchmarks that test particular risky scenarios or complex scenarios, and and that can be a part of the collection of of ways that we assess how methods work is, well, how does it work in this particular kind of a scenario? Uh, so whether whether it's an annotation or otherwise kind of a problem, I think it's an important idea of contributing that kind of a, a focused benchmark in addition to these these grand scale benchmarks that we talk about. Right. It's in some ways it's it's orthogonal, but but related to this idea that Richard described of what do you do at different percent identities, right? Or the idea that somebody had of what do we do for a particular how do we oh it was Adi uh, how do we annotate particular genes or, or particular TE families as opposed to just how do we do it overall? Uh, yes, maybe a partial answer to the question of Clementine about the elitrons. I, I think there is kind of data we do not uh, use uh, very much for annotation is the pangenome data. And uh, there is some information in this where you, you say that you have a conservation if the copy is mobile or not, something like that. So I think we have to also now to take into account this type of data in our T annotation in the pipeline is something that is quite similar to the uh, close uh, the, 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 the species that are closely relative to the species you are using or, or the evolutionary of the uh, evolution of the species see the conservation of some T's. We also need to see that at the level of pangenome, and in particular for the mobile element, for the mobile copies, in fact. It's a good way to identify those that are mobile, still mobile, and also have the boundaries of these uh, copies, because some T's has not the TSD. So it's difficult to see where are the end of the uh, the copy, and uh, and if you want to evaluate where the extension, if the extension is good for for your tools, you need to have the precise precise uh, position, and this type of information is really relevant to 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 see that. So I think we have to not maybe not benchmark tools for annotated pangenome. That's maybe for the future, but at least to use this information to build a good reference. Hi, my name is Rita, <laughs> and um, I have another life where I actually study intracellular bacteria and the symbionts, and um, which are pretty cool. 
And what we're, what I keep hearing uh, and what I have worked with before is only eukaryotic transposable elements. And I know nothing about those IS elements. And anyway, so we have lots of endosymbionts, we have lots of genomes and they are rather large. Sometimes they are rather small because they are symbionts. And I would really need something that is benchmarked for that. And Clément made me ask this question. <laughs> because it was your idea. Actually, there's a lot of effort on what we think of when we're sequencing genomes as contamination, but it's often uh, is in the symbionts or associated symbionts, not endo necessarily, but if you're sequencing a small organism, you get its gut and everything else. And uh, there is a whole kind of set of tools and things for looking at blob toolkit and different components of material from different uh, organisms and how you separate those out. And actually NCBI and EB, INSDC put quite a lot of effort into thinking about this, but, and they're trying to make those tools public. So I don't know how, I think you can go and find what they use to look for material that comes from other or origins. But. It's an idea uh, to share because I'm going to forget. What could be very useful in my opinion is uh, if somebody is providing some CI/CD uh, recipe for uh, some grant tools people think are efficient, and they could use directly with, with their pipeline. Um, it could be linked to a FTP-like repository. But the point is, if somebody is developing something on polymorphism or uh, DNA mitigation, what could go to TIAB, see that there is a CICD uh, for polymorphism reference and directly plug it on GitHub or GitLab. And uh, that could create a kind of common ground for developing just an idea i have the bad task to say that it's over uh but we had an amazing discussion i hope you enjoyed this workshop uh and um it's time so first maybe let's have a round of applause for our guest speaker all the participants we would also like to um <laughs> we would also like to thank uh, all the crew who organized the uh, IST24, um, um, well, in particular, I see Rita here because I talked a lot to Rita, but the, the you saw yesterday that there are a bunch of people. It was amazing. Uh, and, well, please, a round of applause for the organizers of the IST24. And uh, with that, thanks again. Don't forget to contribute. We'll send you a few emails. Just to uh, give a reminder on the, 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 the documents on which uh, everybody can uh, contribute. Uh, Right now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye bye and uh, safe travels back home. <laughs>